we will start the second day of this symposium. Good morning, everyone. Welcome for the second day of uh, our, our meeting. Just before we start uh, to, uh, to talk again about uh, our, uh, our topics uh, on the uh, on the heritage commitment. Uh, I would like to invite Pavlos Grekis uh, to say a few words. Uh, Pavlos Grekis uh, is uh, the General Secretary of Chamber of Commerce and Industry in Messeni and is in charge of tourism. So Pavlos uh, Grekis, the floor is yours uh, to, uh, to talk a little bit to us. Thank you. Καλημέρα σε όλους. Αυτό το καλοκαιρινό πρωινό. Καλώ ήρθατε αγαπητοί προσεκλημένοι από τη φίλη Γαλλία και Πορτογαλία. Αυτό που πραγματεύεται το διήμερο συμπόσιο είναι ο πολιτισμός της Ελιάς. Μας ενώνει όλους εσάς, εμάς και πολλές άλλες χώρες, πολλούς άλλους λαούς. Καλό είναι, ανήκουμε όλοι στη φύση και εμείς και οι ελιές μας. Άρα καλό είναι να σκεπτόμαστε με το μυαλό του δέντρου. Το δέντρο όταν θα φύγουμε εμείς θα παραμείνει. Και αυτό δείχνει πόσο μεγάλη είναι η δύναμή του, πόσο μεγάλη είναι η ικανότητά του να καταγράφει μεν, αλλά να περνάει και μηνύματα. Θα έλεγα ότι είναι σοφό δέντρο γιατί ζώντας ζει εμάς και φεύγοντας εμείς ζει και τις επόμενες γενιές. Άρα η αξία του είναι πανανθρώπινη, ε, μεγάλη και αυτό το δέντρο από μας πρέπει να έχει μόνο τιμή, σεβασμό και πάντα να δίνουμε και εμείς όσο ζούμε κάτι για τη συνέχεια του. Με αυτές τις απλές σκέψεις, το δέντρο της Ελιάς, ένα τόσο μικρό δέντρο, αλλά με τόσο μεγάλη οικονομική αξία και διάσταση, ζήτημα που πραγματεύονται τα επιμελητήρια των χωρών, μέσω των προϊόντων και όχι μόνο, δημιουργούν το ακαθάριστο εθνικό προϊόν σε όλε τι περιοχές που έχουν την τύχη να έχουν ελαιώνες. Με αυτές τις σκέψεις, την καλημέρα μου, αυτή την όμορφη καλοκαιρινή μέρα στην Καλαμάτα και καλή συνέχεια σε όλους. Thank you, Mr. Gregis, for your words that reflect uh, so much on all the conversation we had yesterday and all the things we will say uh, today again. Uh, let's start now our session three, uh, which is dedicated to the stakeholders of the olive tree heritage. Um, we will have uh, four presentations uh, from Portugal and for, from France. And uh, let's start now with a presentation by Bruno Souza, uh, who is a nutritionist uh, in the hospital in, and a researcher in Madeira University. Uh, Bruno Souza uh, will present uh, a, a communication entitled Olive Oil, Culture and Nutrition in the Portuguese Population. Uh, Mr. Souza, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, last day with energy, isn't it? Yes? Okay. Uh, my name is Bruno Souza and I, I am a nutritionist and I came from the islands to talk about olive oil culture and nutrition in Portuguese population. We know that, uh, that olive oil is associated with Mediterranean culture. We know. We also know that Olive oil is an ingredient of Portuguese many dishes, Portuguese dishes, and gastronomy in Portugal. And we know that 
in the point, nutrition point of view, this olive oil have many qualities that uh, have many, uh, many effects on the health of with us. The aim of this work is to know about cultural heritage and the food consumption of this olive oil in Portuguese population, as well as the role of nutritional nutritionists and cooks in valuing this food, the important food. What we know in Portuguese cuisine is that this food, olive oil, is presenting and many dishes in preparation and cooking of many, many dishes and also use in soups, salads, what you eat every day. I, I, I will show you uh, uh, some dishes that we have in Portugal and that we can use the olive oil. It's just some ones. Stew with sardines, with olive oil, with codfish, you know what's codfish, Portugal codfish, with Madeira wine and olive oil. The, our assorda, assorda, it is uh, bread, it's uh, bread, water, uh, olive oil, garlic, we use in the center of the, 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 our country. And bean soup with watercress. It's just some examples that we have in this and our gastronomy. And we also saw, saw that this uh, olive oil is associated with our Mediterranean diet that is followed by many, many, many populations like Greece, like France, like Portugal and other countries. And looking for this Mediterranean pyramid, we can see that olive oil is in the center. So is the main source of fat in our diet. This olive oil have a high nutritional quality, not only about the fat, the good fats, but we have many vitamins and other components that are very important for us and for our health. We know that olive oil resists high temperatures, so it should be choose for cook, cooking and seasonal fat. This is the Portuguese Mediterranean food well. And you can see here in the center, the olive oil. And this food well rep represents the, our cultures, our traditional and the balance of food, many important for our health. So this food pattern, we know that is promote health, protect the environment. Nowadays is very important. Is local food. We eat local food. It's important for our environment. And this Mediterranean diet is considered cultural heritage of humanity. In addition, this is a healthy dietary patterns, reduce many disease and improves quality of life. And what scientific studies tell us about olive oil? We see that prevent many disease like cardiovascular, breast cancer, diabetes. We can see that reduce morbidity and down, slow down the development of cardiovascular and neurodegenerative disease. But also, very important, cancer. But the type of this olive oil is very important. The extra virgin olive oil is related with this uh, nutritional quality. And the effect that it, ha it have to many, many disease, like inflammatory disease, obesity, cancer, asthma, allergies, and any others. Extra virgin olive oil 
have protective effects on cardiometabolic uh, effects and neuroprotective effects that is very important for us. And the last years are emerging the effect on gut microbiota that is very important for us. Many other studies tell us that olive oil promotes gut health. And we can also say, can we also say that this effect will very good for reduce deformation, good for good microbiotic, and reduce the carcinogenesis. So the effect on colorectal cancer. And recently is, you can see, 2022, we just know that we have a suppressed inflammation, cardio protections, anti-cancer protections, but now we have that olive oil attenuate the SARS-CoV-2. For nutrition point of view, we can see that olive oil, it's uh, high in calories and fat, but good fat, mainly monounsaturated fat, have a lot of vitamins, some minerals, and here is important, high amounts of phytosterols and don't have cholesterol. Comparing this with other fats, we can see that olive oil is higher in monounsaturates and lower in saturated fatty acids. That is very important for us. In our country, we can see that the adherence of Mediterranean diet, 26% of our populations have higher adherence for this diet. And we see that women is more and the young people have more adherence to this diet. And we can also see that in last years, this adherence grew 17%. That's good. The future associated with this Mediterranean diet, we can see that cooking with olive oil is the stack. The notoriety of the Mediterranean diet in Portugal is associated with cooking with olive oil. And the data of our country, we can see that the group of fat and oils, olive oil stand out as subgroup with highest consumer. And in our populations, we have an average of intake of 11 grams per day, and is the most used fat in our uh, food pattern. We can also show that uh, comparatively to adults, adolescents have greater vegetable oil consumptions than the elderly, and oil of oil is less consumed by children and adolescents, and butter, and butter is less consumed by the elderly. So these results can be or can be related to promotion that many professionals like nutritional professionals or gastronomy uh, area highlight this cultural heritage as well its consumption. So these actors valuing this heritage. We can do many works with people like education sections, particularly with children and youngs, with other people, education sections. In this paper, talking about olive oil, the importance to consume it. Radio programs, TV programs with cooks, demonstrated how you can use this olive oil. Many products, local products, Mediterranean diet with olive oil. Fish, that we have many fish in Madeira Island. We, we also have many fish. And we can do many, many this 
this kind of uh, actions. Another in institutions like Portuguese Health Foundation also do this work using social media like Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, and to put some uh, information about Mediterranean diet, olive oil, the importance that consume this food, and demonstrate how you can use, using examples. This is some examples that we are doing in this Portuguese foundation. To, con to conclude, we can see that olive oil is a remarkable food in Portuguese society with strong cultural elements and lifestyles, which are reflected in gastronomy and eating habits of the Portuguese population. Nutritionists and cooks have been important actors in evaluating this heritage. Thank you for your attention. And I, I will take this opportunity to invite you to visit Madeira, Madeira Island. We have a good weather, good climate, and we have good food. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruno, for your presentation. Yeah, stay with me in the... In the in, in, in the stage, please. Uh, thank you for your presentation and your invitation in Madeira. Uh, we will, of course, uh, come yeah, in the next year for our next symposium in the olive oil program, the olive oil program. Our next presentation uh, is entitled The Actors of Olive and Olive Oil in Heritage in Portugal, Mapping and Systemization. Uh, it, 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 was a pre, it will be presented by Fernanda Oliveira, uh, who is a professor uh, from the Technical Institute uh, of Leiria and researcher on sustainability and tourism practices. Uh, Fernanda Oliveira will present uh, this, uh, this paper, uh, or, which was written uh, uh, Research, researches that were conducted with Eunice Lopez and Francisco Diaz. Fernanda, you can. Thank you. Good morning to you all. Well, uh, on the beginning of this project, uh, we didn't uh, know much about olive and olive oil culture in Portugal. So we need to begin to understand and, and get knowledge about everything. And one of the topics that were most important for us, it was to know the stakeholders, the ones that um, develop this sector and also the ones that um, contribute also in the tourism uh, uh, sector. So in order to uh, better know uh, olive and olive oil heritage in Portugal. Um, for us, it was important to inv inventory, to map and systematize all the information that we could gather. Well, in terms of methodolo methodology, this is this didn't went well. Well, in terms of research and getting data, we only use secondary data, okay? We use the information available in our institution, uh, in statist statistical national um, agency. And we didn't find uh, organization that has uh, a list uh, about all the sectors. And so we uh, did a research involving um, uh, researching all the institutional and private uh, stakeholders' websites. We um, analyze many indicators, but we choose for this presentation 14. They are listed here. 
So, and uh, we are going to start with the PDO regions, its location and demographic data. So in Portugal, we have six protected designation of origin uh, regions, the PDO regions. They um, involve, they represent 33,000 uh, square kilo kilometers. It represents 37.4% of uh, occupied higher, uh, area of our mainland. And uh, it integrates 85 municipalities where a little bit more than 1 million inhabitants live in, representing 9.7% of all our um, population. Well, in Portugal, we have a problem regarding the, the loss of population. Uh, in the last uh, 10 years, we lost 2.1%, um, but this is um, much worse in the PDO regions. Well, um, just let me say that the PDO Ribatejo is the one that has more people regarding the PDO regions, but in terms of comparing the evolution on the last 10 years, uh, traz os montes on the north, North Alentejano, and the PDO of Moura in the south uh, have lost, uh, pre present the highest uh, loss, uh, losses. So regarding other three um, indicators, the surface area of olive trees, mills and olive production, um, we uh, have um, a little bit more than uh, 379,000 hectares in 2020 uh, all over the, the country. And this, uh, um, uh, and as you may say, as you may see, uh, more than 50% is uh, of the surface uh, is located on the south part of the country. Uh, analyzing, comparing the data in the last uh, 20 years, uh, there was a growth on the surface area of olive tree, uh, but in uh, Alent the Alentejo region, it was the one that grew uh, more, um, 33%, okay? Regarding olive production, in 2020, uh, and in tons, Portugal has 715 uh, thousand tons, 93.7% um, uh, of uh, this production uh, is made on the PDO, on the six PDO regions, and 77% of all the production is located on the south part of our country. And if if you um, if uh, we if we see the last uh, on the south the last two PDOs, uh, the sum of them uh, represents sixty one percent of the uh, olive production. Uh, also, comparing the last uh, the evolution uh, for the last twenty years, uh, well, there there. There is um, um, uh, an increase on the olive production, high increase, more than 200% in all the country. But this number was mainly boosted by the increase of more than 5,000% uh, um, uh, increase in the little region in the Alentejo interior, PDO. We have many olive varieties, but uh, here are represented the most common, the 10 most common varieties. And if you uh, see um, the Galega variety is the one that you may found in more, uh, more PDO regions. Regarding mills, in 2020, there were 461 mills in Portugal. The north region is the one that have more mills, but it was on the um, 
on the south part of Portugal that you may see uh, the, the increase of, of mills. They have a, a few number of mills, but they are um, uh, growing. So re regarding these uh, three indicators, in fact, we didn't found specific numbers uh, related to the olive sector, but we thought it, it was very important to share these numbers with you because we uh, think that they reflect also uh, the, the, the situation of uh, olive and olive oil uh, production in Portugal. So regarding the agricultural labor force, uh, it, it is mostly uh, based, family-based, 88.7%. And um, um, in 2019, we, have, uh, we had um, 648,000 um, workers. And also, the, the um, this uh, family based uh, sector is uh, much strong in uh, in the north of of portugal um concerning individual agriculture producers by gender uh well the the proportion uh, we have um almost um 280,000 uh, producers uh, and 32.9% uh, of them are uh, female. And uh, in the, between 2009, 2019, uh, there were um, an increase between 2.9 and 6.4% uh, in the proportion of um, individual agriculture producer, producers, um, women. Um, concerning agriculture holdings, and I'm talking here about the, the farms, okay, uh, well, uh, we have uh, 286,000 uh, um, uh, farms in 2009, there was a decrease, a national decrease of 31%. Um, the the region, the PDO region with more farms are is Trasmont because they are well. Portugal it's uh, as different contests in the north region. We have many owners and uh, little plots, little farms. In average, they have uh, twelve hectares. And then in the north regions, because we have large areas, and traditionally, in terms of um, property dimension, we always have much uh, huge farms with uh, large dimensions. So also, in terms of farms, but here regarding if they are a self-employed or rented business, mostly we have all over the country and on the six uh, PDO regions, um, a self-employed business and um, uh, with 95.5%. Uh, well, regarding olive and olive oil tourism related stakeholders, uh, we are beginning. Uh, it's not easy to have uh, a precise number of all the stakeholders that um, offers services and experiences um, of tourism, but um, well, we gather some information. We uh, uh, identify uh, 88 situations regarding museums that uh, um, are equitative distributed by the, the, the three, uh, three nodes, three uh, big regions. Uh, also tourism business and regarding tourism business, I, we are talking about travel agencies, tour operators uh, mostly, um, also one or two recreation uh, enterprises, tourism accommodation that has olive experience, experience and also uh, those um, 
wine companies that we talked uh, yesterday that are beginning to produce also um, olive oil and that organize uh, tourist visits and also the events. Well, I may say that I don't know what happens in France and in Greece, but in our country, well, we have more than 300 municipalities, more than 1,000 parish, and each one has its own festival or uh, gastronomic fair, okay? But I'm not talking about these ones. And in, in all of them, uh, the olive oil is present. Okay, uh, in, in the confection of foods, of dishes, but also the producers promote their, their, their products. But I'm talking about the ones that are focused, focused only on the olive oil and olive. The fair of olive oil, the festival of uh, olives, that ones, and uh, we found um, eight, okay? And we also have here the ones that are organized annually. Okay, so, and there are some differences, more, uh, more of the situa situations uh, regarding all the, the, the services and experiences. There are more uh, in, in, in the region, in the South region, uh, and then North, and then in the last, um, the, the Central region. Okay, so to sum up, uh, in regional terms, there are different types uh, of olive grove, um, um, ownership and property dimension, olive and olive oil um, production techniques, and different business strategies, uh, from traditional models to super intensive production models. Uh, but despite this, the family nature of olive and olive oil production is still very strong in our country. And this represents an extremely valuable heritage that must be listed, researched, uh, preserved, and promoted. Uh, regarding the olive oil um, and olive-based tourism, we found that there's no organized uh, information uh, regarding business and cultural and recreation stakeholders that already offers these services and experience. So this is an opportunity uh, to us to get to know the actors, to gather data uh, in an organized and structured way to contribute to this living heritage in a sustainable way, promoting network, uh, engaging people, experiences, knowledge, and raising awareness and commitment. So, thank you. Thank you, Fernanda, for your presentation that gives us a, a very strong synthesis of the different sectors uh, of the stakeholders in, in Portugal that will be very helpful to reflect with uh, other uh, situations in Greece and, and France. Um, now our third presentation, uh, it, we, are, we will come to France uh, with uh, a paper entitled Confraternities and Association groups of actors mobilized to promote the heritage of the olive tree. Uh, Eric Triquet, uh, will, who is with us, uh, is a professor in communication and media studies and in, the, in Avignon University and in the Centre Norbert Elias. He will talk with Pauline Grison, who is uh, uh, remotely um, and will be called uh, very soon, I think. Uh, who is also uh, a teacher and researcher in Avignon University and in the Centre Norbert Elias, uh, uh, and who is also a worker in, uh, in a museum. Eric, the floor is yours. Uh, is Pauline online? Okay, so you can start. Thank you, Marion. Good morning to all. We are going to present you our research which deals with organization. We said uh, we can say the association or organization. 
Organization is a group of actors mobilized to promote the heritage of the olive tree. Uh, in this communication, we will present the first result of this study. We propose to show you analysis, an analysis in several points. Who are these actors? The origin of their commitment, their objectives, and their actions, their participation in the heritage process of olive growing activities, and their, percept and their perception of this heritage. Now, our methodology, we are studying six organizations from four different French departments. We have developed a content analysis of website and communication documents. And with our students, we conducted semi-structured interviews with members of this organization. Then let's have a look uh, at the actor of this process. We can notice a common point between them, the attachment of the olive tree. Most of the actor are small non-professional owners of the, ter of the territory, family owners. They are also volunteers. Uh, volunteers and amateurs, you know, volunteers, volunteers. Amateurs also mean that they do not receive any income from olive growing, but, but they are expert amateurs. The expert amateurs motivated by the desire to pass on their knowledge and skill, skills. Now, we also have to note the origin of commitment. It was in 1956 rise, you know, and subsequent abandonment in uh, to do a historic break. So their motives are to save, to preserve, to revive the olive tree, to rehabilitate variety growing, but also to develop the territory. They declare that they take on a mission of public utility. Uh, yes. So then let's explore the, uh, the objective announced today. They highlight the following actions, support, encourage, strengthen, promote, enhance, maintain. The objectives oriented towards olive tree, local or endangered varieties, diversity, Longevity, olive growing, family producers, sustainable practices, quality, and territory, environment, landscape, development, social, cultural, economic development. Now, let us expose the wide variety of actions. Rehabilitation and maintenance, 
including harvesting, training and demonstration, educational workshop, transfer of knowledge, conferences, exhibition, publication, festive and convivial events, study on olives, identification, census, mapping, but also trips to meet other amateur producers. The audiences of this action are members of organization, members active and beneficiaries, local population, school children, local agents, tourists, but, but also themselves. Pauline, are you ready? <laughs> yes, can you hear me? Okay, several elements characterize these actions that we could uh, sum up with the three words, reactivity, regularity, and diversity. These actions are also characterized by innovative forms, uh, which may be a more traditional context, do not allow. And these forms include different approaches, which are collective and or participative and or solidarity based and always voluntary except maybe for certain training courses, but these ones are always offered. It leads to what we call a heritage in action, which is uh, contemporary with the olive growing activities and which is social, committed and innovative. Finally, we would like to discuss two important points of our study. First, um, the olive tree as an object and determinant of the process for several reasons. First, because of its longevity and the symbols that are associated with this longevity. Because also of the olive growing activity itself, which foresees a collective operation and because of its landscape dimension, which is exceptional and which induces a collective responsibility. And finally, because of its ecological interest regarding its tolerance to drought, uh, its benefits for biodiversity, for example. The second point that we can highlight in conclusion of uh, this study is that the respondents do not refer to the past as if the olive heritage were inscribed in the present and were oriented towards the future. To explain this statement, we can uh, suggest three hypotheses. First is that the breakup of the forest in 1956 prevented any transmission but olive growing did not die out. It was uh, reactivated and it's now uh, alive again today. And third hypothesis is that the relationship with the olive growing activity, the, with the olive growing heritage is inseparable from a relationship with the territory. And in consequence, these uh, actors of the olive heritage do not have uh, the aim of creating museums. They look to the future. To conclude, we wanted to, to say that this study shows a multifaceted representation of what makes up the heritage for these actors. Uh, for them, heritage covers scientific knowledge and knowledge under construction uh, which they help to develop. It covers also know-how and practices, we could say good practices, methods and techniques that uh, are to be shared, transmitted and uh, developed. 
but heritage for them is also biodiversity of living organisms at different levels uh, within landscapes or within the olive tree family. And heritage for them is, of course, uh, cultural contents like poetry, songs, uh, or tales, but also quality products and uh, olive and oil, especially. Um, heritage covers also traditions like festivals that mark the major moments of the year, uh, like uh, harvest, like oil filtration also. And um, heritage for these actors includes also values like respect for the living, biodiversity, or the fact of living together. We thank you for your attention. <laughs> thank you, Eric and um, Pauline, for your presentation that gives us um, uh, an overview of uh, uh, of the non-professional stakeholders, that uh, is really interesting to to have uh, in comparison with uh, the, the the two presentations we had just before. Um, we'll go on with our fourth uh, paper today. It is more on presentation. Sorry, um, it is called "Emergence of New Stakeholders in Olive Oil Tourism." challenges of the industrialization of the olive sector in Portugal. Uh, the research were, was conducted uh, by Jao Vasconcelos, uh, Francisco Diaz and Nuno Rodriguez. Um, the paper will be uh, given by Jao Vasconcelos, who is a geographer from the Poly Polytechnic Institute uh, of Leria and researchers, a researcher on environment and climate change. Uh, I think he will. Zhao is remote. He's online. Yeah. So, Zhao, the floor is yours. Oh, no. Can you hear me now? Good morning. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Okay, first of all, I would like to start by saying uh, thank you for the opportunity of sharing our work at the distance. I'm really sorry not to be there with you. I'm, I'm going to maybe contribute to what the Portuguese team has been mentioning in the other presentations. And I'm sharing a kind of geographic perspective on these changes of stakeholders that we've been mentioning uh, in several presentations. So uh, I'll start by saying that I'm going to talk a little bit about the recent changes in the olive production, and I'm going to focus on the production. We'll see what, how this relates to the stakeholders. I'm going to talk about the land cover changes in partner countries, then what happens in Portugal in specific, and what the implications of these changes for the emergence of the, of the roles of the new stakeholders taking a stand in the olive uh, scenario in Portugal. So some of this curiosity of, of this present work came from a, a publication. It, it was published in 2019 in Olive Oil Times, and it mentioned that olive oil production data in Europe reveal divergent trends. Well, as a geographer, this clearly made me think, and we looked what the text says, and it says the production in Italy and Greece is down sharply in Portugal and Spain is dramatically higher. We've, we've all heard in Portugal the news about the, the increase of olive oil and olive production. So we, we were kind of curious to look uh, to the data. And furthermore, this publication mentioned that the sector gained a boost in Portugal and Spain by a favorable environment for investment to create infrastructures and modernization of olive groves. This specific person in a documentary even says that in Portugal and in Spain and this, well, these new modern olive groves represent an, uh, the 
earliest or the, the most recent agriculture revolution since the Romans. No. Okay. The paper, the, 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 well, the post also mentions that due to similar traditional olive farming systems, this boost, this trend was not observed in Italy and Greece. Okay, so we, we were quite curious with this information. So I, I used the Copernicus land use, land cover uh, data analysis. This is the spatial analysis for all Europe uh, describing uh, land cover when we use several time frames, And this is what we observed. So in yellow, we, we extracted all land cover possible and we maintained what it was classified as an olive grove. This is in the millions hectares uh, for all Europe and in white we have signaled the partner countries. So what we could see is that during the 90s and even in 2006 there was a relative constant area of olive groves in Europe. What we can all obviously see, this is a, a biome associated production that we have olive trees in the south of Europe. We don't have it in the north, north of Europe as everyone would expect. We have a huge concentration in Spain and Italy and a few in Portugal, a little bit in the south of France and in Greece, but also in Turkey and Syria. We also could see some. We couldn't see here because it's only for Europe, but we could see this is the region where there's a predominance of olive, of, uh, olive groves. What we did see in the changing years, it is in 2012, we could observe a small increase in specific in these regions that I ask you to pay attention. And what we could see in the last available year of the land cover data is that we have been watching a dramatic increase in several countries. We could also see when we're looking at the tabular information, we could see that there's a huge difference between the partner countries. And we can see that although most of them, well, maybe not France, but Portugal and Greece have increased tremendously the, the area of olive groves, we can still see that in Greece, there's almost roughly the double of the area that Portugal has. And in France, the area occupied by olive groves is much, much less than the other partners. Even, even so, it has been showing a slight decrease over the years uh, of olive groves. This doesn't take out the role and the importance of the olive groves, but it just gives you an idea of the increase and the intensity. That's what I'm heading of the production of olive groves in these countries. Looking to, uh, to the Portuguese case, when we analyze the Portuguese sub-regional uh, or, or regional analysis, we can see that it's highly different what we have in Portugal in terms of spatial distribution. So in the Alentejo region, nearly the south, uh, near south, we, have, we had in 2006, almost 55% of the total olive groves that we have in Portugal. And this is the hectares, the, the absolute number of hectares. And what we could see is that in the Algarve region and in Lisbon, the percentage of olive groves is residual. But when we look to the changing years, what we could see is that there has been a, a strong increase in those regions that already had a lot of olive groves, like, for instance, the Alentejo. And of course, we have a dramatic increase in the Algarve, but it still remains less than 3% of the global olive groves in Portugal. So this is just to highlight and to, and to share the perspective of what is happening in, the, in Portugal specific in this region of the Alentejo. Well, Francisco has brought this data before and just to bring it back uh, to, to mention here again, what we could see if we don't look specific to the area occupied by olive groves, but the traditional olive mills in Portugal, we could see what, we could, what could probably everyone expect. From 95 to 2020, there has been an in, impressive decline of the number of traditional olive mills in Portugal. This has, been, his, this has many reasons. One of the main reasons is the modernization of the process. The other one is the phytosanitary demands that these olive mills have been suffering over the years. But 
What's so interesting to see is that there has been an abrupt reduction, uh, maybe in 2003, and North region, in the North, of course, Alentejo and Trás dos Montes became similar one to another. And what we can see that the Baixo Alentejo, that's further south in the Alentejo region, has been always showing a less percentage of traditional olive mills. So again, going back to the data, sorry to bother you with this. This is just to, to show you again the same uh, representative. So we're talking about an increase of olive uh, area, a decrease of traditional olive mills, especially in the Alentejo region. Oops. So this is it. So where has this been leading us? This has been leading us to a profound change in the landscape in the, some regions in Portugal associated with olive groves. This is a super intensive olive production in the Alentejo. Uh, this is another picture of a super productive in uh, uh, olive groves. And this is also what Francisco has brought us yesterday. And we have been the, watching to the change in the olive production but also in the products usually associated with olive oil. So when we're talking about uh, the stakeholders involvement, the engagement with the participation, the heritage, we should pay attention to the, these profound changes that are happening in some regions in Portugal. This is the Lagar do Marmelo. This is one very modern olive mill. It's obviously designed for intensive production, but it's also close associated with tourism. On its website, it mentions you could visit uh, this modern uh, mill from this period to this period. It has a booking reservation, it has guides. So it's a pretty well structured uh, tourism product uh, besides the production. And if we look to other big producers of wine and, and olive oil in the region, we could also see that they mentioned on their website, discover our olive oil production process and explore a modern and innovative olive oil. So we have been watching this emergence of big uh, companies entering in the process of combining olive production with other elements that may be associated with heritage or with other products as tourism that we could probably discuss further. On the other hand, we have been always uh, also watching a new type of movement or discourse coming up. So this is one of the most important N uh, NGOs uh, on, uh, on Portugal, environmental organization, that has, has been publishing more than once that the super intensive olive grove uh, process has uh, health problems and it's, it's not good for the biodiversity. And so there's a type of discourse that is emerging that is probably associated with another perspective of the whole olive oil. Uh, this is a, a very important uh, instrument. This is a, a book, a photo book published by André. Uh, I was supposed to bring it with me to the conference to show you. This is a book that pinpoints the, the other side of the olive oil production that we hardly ever see. That's the negative effects of the intensive uh, labor of the environmental consequences, air, air pollution, the movement of the communities against this type of production. So uh, we just wonder if are we heading to a sort of antagonization of the communities uh, uh, facing this olive oil production? And if so, what are the consequences when we characterize the stakeholders? So just to sum up, uh, this is a work that is not finished, it's an ongoing work, it's involved with other papers that were Fran um, Francisco told earlier. Fernanda also mentioned the type of product, tourism product, product associated with olive oil. So we just ask ourselves, what type of products and how structured are associated with the industrialization of olive oil and what or who are the actors that are being replaced or transformed in this process? And how do local communities feel in the process of industrialization? Can we somehow sense an iridex 
a, a, doyen, a typical doyen iridex model coming up. So this is the questions that we have that are feeding the other presentations. And this is what I had to share with you today. I would love to say, to conclude by saying thank you for your attention, but I can hardly do that because I'm absolutely jealous with the pictures that I get. And I'm really sorry not to be there with you and thank you so much. Thank you, Joel, for your presentation. Uh, that was very, a very good uh, complimentary to, to those that we, we listened uh, just, uh, just before. Um, now we have uh, uh, a time for discussion, and then uh, we will uh, hear uh, our two, the two interns uh, of uh, uh, the, the foundation Roots of Olive Trees, just before we have the, the coffee break. Do you have a question in the audience? Yes. I have not a question, just uh, um, I want to ask João to uh, explain a little bit better <clears throat> the final sentence he pronounced, uh, because I think most of people here don't know what is uh, Duxy model, Iridex, and the, he uh, maybe uh, did, did think about that is with other audience not from tourism. Could I could I answer now? Should I, should I wait for other questions? You can uh, you can reply. Okay, so yeah, maybe this is was more uh, focused on the tourism audience. And thank you, Francisco. When I mentioned Iridex model, this is a type of, um, this is a study from Doyen and he uh, describes the level of engagement or the opposite uh, between tourism and the community. And in some level you can have uh, engagement of the community and you have empathy with the community and the tourism process, but when the tourism intensifies, and this is the analogy with, uh, uh, with the pro olive oil production, intensive olive oil production in Portugal, when you have the intensification of the, an activity, you may observe an antagonism attitude between the community and the activity itself. So Iridex model is something that, it was kind of a provocation that we, we brought up just to, to make, make us think, is this news? Because we talk, we, we, we do feel passionate about the subject. This is quite obvious. Everyone talks with passion and I do also. But we talk about the stakeholders and the involvement of the communities and the heritage, always in the positive perspective. And that we could probably just do our own reflection and think about, in some cases, the oil, oil heritage may be affected by a negative uh, attitude from the community towards the production itself. And this is what the Iridex provocation was about. Thank you, Francisco. Other questions, comments, remarks? Um, thank you. I would like to pose a question to the speakers, um, also Fernanda and Juan, but also the other speakers. You talked and presented uh, quite vividly and through data, the development of uh, olive groves, uh, particularly in Portugal. And you also talked about the um, emergence of uh, industrial industrialized stakeholders, which is uh, which follows or is because of this development. What are your views uh, and ideas about the future? Do you see uh, the industry replacing uh, the small producers? Um, do you foresee a model um, or an opportunity, a chance to balance between this industrialization uh, and um, 
preserving the diversity of uh, the olive varieties and the diversity of, of uh, stakeholders, middle to small stakeholders and product producers? But I feel that there are more 
I don't know if I can just, uh, I completely agree with Fernanda. I, I don't think that the super intensive oil of production in the industrialization is going to kill all the producers, traditional producers. They're not going to replace them. We're not going to, to have a replacement of the traditional by the recent industrialization. This is, this is kind of a nightmare that some people uh, like to talk about, but I don't think it will ever happen due to geographical conditions to the, uh, well, that will always be traditional olive oil production. Uh, this is quite interesting. So we should keep the activity in, in, in the heritage. We should keep it uh, as our main focus, I would say, not because it has been, it's going to disappear due to the industrialization, but because it is profoundly rich for the communities and, um, and the sense of place and, uh, and the, it's, it's part of our life. And this is why we call it heritage. So we should keep it because of its value, not because of it's in risk of disappearing. Uh, but on the other hand, I would also like to mention that uh, the, these new powerful stakeholders they're they're not they're not here uh, on on their way to somewhere else. They're here to stay. So we they sh we should also be trying to see how could we include them because they are effectively new stakeholders and have probably new perspectives of of what we would call tradition of the instruments of the process of the um, of the visiting of the organization of the land. So th they are also part of the stakeholders that are here today. So they are not actually replacing the traditional. We always have the traditional, but they gain force and they are more than one. And they are occupying a space that was not here before. So we should look at it. Are there other questions or comments? Yes. The mic is coming. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Η πρώτη ερώτηση είναι για τον κύριο Μπρούνο. Ε, θα ήθελα να κάνετε αναφορά ε, στις μεγάλες διαφορές των σπορελαίων ε, σε σχέση με το ελαιόλαδο και την αφορμή την παίρνω από το γεγονός ότι έχουμε μία ισχυρή πίεση αυτή την εποχή λόγω της χρήσης των σπορελαίων του ηλιαλαίου πιο συγκεκριμένα, το οποίο όμως ήδη ε, μετά την εισβολή στην Ουκρανία εκτοξεύτηκε η τιμή μονάδος. Υπάρχει μια παρανόηση για την οποία, γνώμη, για την οποία και εμείς ως επιμελητήριο ετοιμαζόμαστε να κάνουμε ε, εξειδικευμένες ε, εκδηλώσεις και συνεργασίες για να καταδείξουμε αυτές τις διαφορές. Η χρήση του σπορελαίου, εμείς πιστεύουμε, σε μια ελαιοπαραγωγή, ελαιοπαραγωγική χώρα και τόπο, όπως είμαστε εμείς εδώ, ήταν καθαρά θέμα, θέμα τιμής ως τώρα, τιμής μονάδος. Ενώ στην ουσία, κατά την άποψή μας πάλι, ε, είναι εντελώς ακατάλληλο, υπό την έννοια ότι έχει κορεσμό πιο γρήγορο στις θερμοκρασίες. Θέλω να τα επιβεβαιώσετε αυτά ως ειδικό περισσότερο. Ε, δεν τις κάνω τις άλλες δύο για να ε, μην ξεχαστούν οι ερωτήσεις. Thank you. It's the better, uh, the best choice uh, to cook, um, resist uh, the high temperatures, and so I, uh, we we know with the literature that uh, uh, the the olive oil is the best choice. In the fats that we have, it's the, the best.
Η δεύτερη ερώτηση ε, είναι στην κυρία Φερνάντα. Ε, στο μέλλον, τα εργατικά χέρια βλέπετε να υποχωρούν ε, σε ποσοστό της συνολικής απασχόλησης. Γιατί, όπως άκουσα, ε, είναι μεγάλο το ποσοστό του πληθυσμού που, όπως και εδώ, στο δικό μου τόπο, ε, καλλιεργεί και παραδοσιακά και οικογενειακά, όπως το περιγράψατε ακριβώς. Όμως, η εντατικότερη ε, καλλιέργεια παρατηρείται και εδώ, όπως είπε και ο κύριο Ζάου πριν από λίγο, παρατηρείται και εδώ και το ρέτομα που θέτω είναι συγκεκριμένο. Επειδή η ανάγκη σε εργατικά χέρια ε, που δεν, μηχανικά δεν αντικαθαστούνται, ό,τι και να κάνουμε, βελτιώνεται, μειώνεται ε, η χρήση των εργατικών χεριών, αλλά δεν μπορεί να εξαλειφθεί με τίποτα στη συγκεκριμένη καλλιέργεια. Άρα πιστεύετε ότι θα χρειαστούμε ως χώρες, ως περιοχές που έχουμε λεόνες έτσι κι αλλιώς και τους αυξάνουμε. Θα χρειαστούμε να έχουμε εργατικά χέρια από τρίτες χώρες και αυτό στο μέλλον να ενταθεί περισσότερο. Um, once again, I um, must remember that we are two scenarios, two realities. We are already needing labor force from other countries. These super intensive uh, farms are um, supported with immigrants from um, India, Pakistan, and other countries. And the negative impacts that, sh that, that Shmong has uh, presented, we are starting to feel it uh, in, in the south of the country because these persons come and, and don't have, in some cases, in some farms, they don't have the proper conditions to live, okay? They believe better that they live on their own countries, but it's not enough. And we need to, to do uh, in a better way these two things. So we have already needs, strong needs in terms of um, uh, labor force in the South, but in the North, there are families, okay? So, um, um, if we engage the young, the, the young generation and we continue to involve the, the families and the youngest, I'm, I'm, I don't feel that it, it, it will be a problem because um, rooted on our families and the youngest start to uh, learn about the process so on the north and on the south of the country, maybe the problem is not so um, strong. But then we have other, um, other problem that is the population aging. And if this culture doesn't pass through the youngest generations, if we are losing time, okay, uh, perhaps um, we are facing a problem. But I do believe that perhaps projects that all live for all, they are not going to resolve all these problems. But we, if we help a little bit, it will be good, okay? Thank you very much. And I believe that the Ivoria Mesoyos ε, αντιμετωπίζει τα ίδια ακριβώ προβλήματα. Ε, αισθάνομαι ότι η μόνη χώρα ε, που βρέχεται από τη Μεσόγειο ε, και βρίσκεται δίπλα μας, σε εμάς, η Τουρκία δηλαδή, είναι η μόνη που δεν αντιμετωπίζει τέτοια προβλήματα 
και οι λόγοι είναι τρει. Δημογραφικό, μια χαρά πάντα πράγματα. Ε, παραδοσιακά εκτελούνται οι καλλιέργειε σε όλα τα επίπεδα. Ε, και βέβαια έχει και κομμάτι εντατικοποίηση και εκεί σε όλου του τομεί τη οικονομία. Ε, άρα η μοίρα μα, η Βόρεια Μεσόγειος είναι κοινή. Ε, έχω και μία τρίτη ερώτηση στον κύριο Σάου για το μεγάλο ζήτημα που αναφέρατε σε σχέση με τις επιπτώσεις της περιβαλλοντολογικές που δεν σας κρύβω ότι και στην περιοχή τη συγκεκριμένη τη δική μας εδώ στο νομό και ως αρχές το αντιμετωπίζουμε καθημερινά όταν αρχίζει η περίοδο από το φθινόπωρο δηλαδή μέχρι να πάμε Φεβρουάριο τη επόμενη χρονιά, που γίνεται η υπεξεργασία. Εκεί. Α... Ναι. Αυτό που ε, θέτω ω ερώτημα είναι το εξή. Πιστεύετε, χωρί να προηγηθεί η επίλυση τεχνολογικά του προβλήματο, Μπορεί να πάμε σε εντατικοποίηση, κάτι που συμβαίνει, όπως αποδείχθηκε και από τις απαντήσεις και τις εισηγήσεις. Μπορούμε τελικά να αντιμετωπίσουμε το περιβαλλοντολογικό. Εκτιμώ δηλαδή ότι πάει πίσω η τεχνολογική εξέλιξη στην αντιμετώπιση των προβλημάτων από τα υπολείμματα της επεξεργασίας του ολοκάρπου. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. João, esta pergunta é para ti e eu vou tentar traduzir, está bem? Muito bem. It's easier in português, ok? Sorry. Um, então, uh, estão a perguntar-te se, um, em relação a este processo de industrialização, se não devíamos estar mais preocupados numa fase inicial em resolver os problemas ambientais uh, do que seguir... Uh, com o processo de industrialização, se não devíamos já resolver este, os problemas ambientais e uh, antecipar os riscos de, que daí advêm da industrialização. Thank, thank you for the question, and, and I think we have now an hour to discuss this, right? <laughs> uh, it, it's a very good question, but, but I don't think that we are able to answer it correctly. So we do have a huge problem in terms of the environment of super intensive production. But this happens with olive oils and it happened with uh, other type of super intensive production. Um, I would say the main concerns about the super intensive production, they come from two sides as, as far as we can hear. One of them, and it's very well known because several uh, organizations are doing what they can, it's to refer to the environmental issues of the super production, uh, super intensive production. And this is the, the head of the type of discourse that comes in, in Portugal. So the super intensive production is harmful in terms of environment. So I would say, yes, this is the main reason why it's being looked at and some people are talking about the control and some kind of uh, legislation to, that could control the area occupied by super intensive production. But there's another type of discourse that is coming at the same time. And this is where I'm not sure if one should be ahead of the other, but we should look at the collective problems and benefits that the super intensive production has. So it does have an environmental problem that it's the main topic of this course, but there's also 
a lack of integration, uh, a lack of labor conditions uh, applied. It do affect the communities where people live. There's a, another type of discourse that should be aligned with environmental discourse. But I would, I would agree that we should probably think better about the industrialization process and how harmful it can be. And yet it can be very good for the, for, for, for as well. So we could, there's a balance between things and we should try and see both sides of the, of the problem. Thank you for all your comments. Uh, maybe just before we go to, uh, to to the coffee break, I would like to give the floor to uh, Gaëtan Schlosser and uh, Fantine Thor uh, as uh, the two interns of the foundation, uh, the roots of olive tree, to explain what they do uh, in during their internship. Can you hear us properly? Yeah. Okay. So as uh, you present us, we are intending the foundation of the roots of the olive tree. And we are in our last year of uh, master. And we are here working on a main project that is called the uh, chain of value that Mr. Caravetos presented us uh, yesterday. Uh, this project um, is uh, have as a main goal to find point in history uh, for olive patrimony uh, in the Mediterranean countries. And uh, so to explain uh, the principle of uh, our mission is uh, first to create a census and uh, get gather data. After that, with all of that, we set up an, inter an, uh, an inventory in different categories. And with all of that, we create a map uh, where we propose uh, itineraries around all the points of interest. Um, to sum up our work and our researches, we gather all the elements linked to the um, olive, uh, olive tree heritage, and we put um, our data in uh, three categories on maps, such as uh, the craftsmanships. So on the maps, you can find uh, there uh, the wineries, which propose some uh, olive growing, the olive farms and the olive growing. We propose also um, tourism sites as uh, where you can, where people or tourists can find art or artists, visits and historical sites. And uh, finally, the touristic sites, the touristic service, sorry. So the touristic service such as the restaurants, the accommodations, uh, which promotes olive growing or um, locality and most of all traditions. So with this project, we are trying to develop a networking by offering a cultural itinerary and promoting a responsible local and traditional tourism, but also by creating uh, therefore a synergy between all these points of interest. And that's it. Thank you for listening to us. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you all for the presentation uh, that gives us a very good clear view of the different stakeholders, both professionals and non professionals, uh, small uh, stakeholders, and big and new ones. Uh, and we will continue our discussion. Reflections after the break at uh, 11 and 20. Thank you.
Zoom. Good morning once again. We're going to restart with the last session, session four, entitled Raising Awareness, Engagement and Transmission. Um, we are going to begin um, with Laurent Sebastien that comes from the University of Nice, okay? He is an anthropologist and the presentation is called Olive Sector and Olive Festivals in Provence, France, Communities with Variable Geometry. Uh, okay, so thank you very much. So thank you uh, for inviting me here. Um, I would uh, just begin uh, uh, by um, saying something about the project uh, because, um, well, I feel that, uh, well, it's a European uh, cooperation. And um, in, in common sense, if you look at this through common sense categories, I suppose that we should... Uh, have uh, some sort of output from this uh, cooperation, as it might be expected. Uh, if you look uh, at uh, the situation in general, uh, Portugal and Greece are uh, peripheral countries in, uh, in the European frame, and France is uh, more central. I mean, in just in general terms. But if you look at the situation from the olive uh, point of view, uh, then uh, Portugal and Greece are very central in, in the production, whereas France is uh, very peripheral. Uh, it is uh, in the northern part of the, uh, uh, ol of the olive growing uh, zone, and the production is very uh, small, as uh, we have seen from figures uh, before. So I suppose that uh, uh, this double shift is uh, is interesting in itself, and that uh, we can reach a very complementary expertise in a comparative perspective uh, in this project. And uh, other important aspects uh, I have noted during these days is uh, first the intergenerational approach, and I have been interested to see that young researchers were there were here with us. Uh, and more and more senior uh, researchers too, and uh, also uh, the participative approach is interesting here. I, I suppose with the practitioners on the one side and the researchers on the other side. And the third interesting feature in our meeting is that uh, we are speaking about roads, and if speaking about roads is always speaking about uh, encounters. So these were some preliminary uh, remarks from my point of view. Uh, as an anthropologist participating in this uh, in this uh, program, now um, I would like to speak about um, uh, a subject I have been studying for more than twenty years now: uh, olive festivals in in France, in the south of France, in in the in Provence. Um, and uh, the theoretical context I use is uh, first uh, the one of the cultural relations people have with the nature, the environment, and the techniques. And uh, uh, another point in the theoretical context is that um, I am uh, first a specialist of cultural identities. So uh, the main point of my presentation is uh, to look at, uh, not at olive oil and, and olives at, for themselves, but look at them um, as uh, symptoms of uh, uh, what uh, our societies are, are becoming. Um, I am also very in much interested in uh, heritage building processes. And uh, as far as uh, methods are concerned, I uh, use the method, uh, the accepted methods of ethnography. So fieldwork, uh, intensive fieldwork with, within the communities. I, I, I go in the festivals, I, I, I play with people, I, I speak with people and most of uh, uh, my um, research is based on this uh, in vivo uh, approach, participative approach. And what I try to do is uh, to look at uh, the cultural identities today, um, what are uh, real cultural identities and what are 
claimed uh, cultural identities because um, an anthropologist, uh, a French anthropologist, uh, Christian Bromberger, has said, um, in our modern world, we uh, we seem uh, more and more. It seems that we are more and more uh, all all the same with globalization. We it seems that everything is the same everywhere, but at the same time, um, the people uh, have a strong. Um, idea of their difference and of their identities so the two things go together uh, in an anthropological point of view you cannot speak only about globalization but you also have to take in account um, differentiation and claims for cultural identities which is a very important trend in in today's world um if uh, so this is uh, the outline of what i will uh, tell you today. Um, concerning the historical background um, of my research, um, I would like to uh, stress the point that uh, there was not really uh, olive festivals. No, there was no olive festivals in traditional Mediterranean countries, and especially in Mediterranean France. I mean that uh, olive oil was used in the in the religious rituals, of course, but there was no, nothing such as uh, olive festivals or festivals dedicated to olive or festivals dedicated to olive oil. Um, of course, olive oil and olives were part of traditional culture, but they were not celebrated as such. And um, if you look at uh, traditional societies, uh, and in, in particular in Provence, in the south of France, the only things you find uh, before the modern era were uh, intimate gatherings, family gatherings after the harvest, after the olive harvest. And the olive harvest in France, as I told you, is in the north. And when, when it comes to November or December, when you, when you, when you pick up the olives, uh, it is um, uh, very uh, cold. It is very cold. Uh, so the people are, uh, have they have done festivals and celebrations all the summer, but uh, when they're doing the olive harvest, they're not uh, in the mood of feasting. Sometimes they sing, sometimes uh, they joke uh, from one tree to another, but it's not, um, it's, it's really um, intimate uh, jokes and uh, things like that. It, um, the, um, the picking season uh, is, uh, is is a, is a, is a, is is a cold season. Uh, so, in terms of history, uh, olive oil was only used in Christian celebrations, but not in uh, profane uh, events. Now, uh, another part of the context is that uh, uh, traditional rituals have been revived, have been ritualized in uh, in Europe. Um, since uh, the 1970s, since about since about 50 years, um, a, a researcher, in, a specialist in tourism, who worked on uh, the Isle of Malta, uh, Jeremy Boissevin, uh, who worked in Malta from the 1960s to the 1990s, told that uh, there had been a, a great decrease in uh, in traditional uh, rituals. Uh, in the middle of the 20th century, because the people didn't believe anymore in uh, in their own uh, culture, and this was um, uh, because of industrialization, because of urbanization, because of uh, the exodus of people trying to 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 find a better life in cities. So um, um, all the local, the village festivals, the rituals, um, most of them disappeared during the 20th century, but unexpectedly um, in the 1970s, there was another trend uh, to uh, revitalization, so an increase of uh, new old style festivals. And uh, new old style festivals are diverse. Uh, in fact, there are a lot of them for a lot of different uh, products. A lot of uh, fruits, a lot of vegetables have their own uh, local festivals. I have uh, tried to, to, to make a quantitative survey of, of these uh, uh, festivals dedicated to, uh, to uh, 
agricultural products in France, and I have counted more than five or six thousand. <laughs> So it's it's really a lot. And discussing with a few people here, uh, we saw that uh, in port only in, in Portugal, uh, you had eight different uh, festivals concerning olive oil. Um, in France, uh, it's uh, about the same, maybe ten. I will speak about three or four of them. And I suppose it would be interesting to to map uh, these things and to and to have a. Uh, an overview and and to to know about to know more about these uh, these festivals. So the point here is that uh, neo tradition or tradition today is part of modernity. It is not opposed to modernity because the more modern we are and the more we try to claim our roots and we the more we try to claim uh, our traditions. And this is why I suppose people um, well. Uh, create uh, new festivals. And these are the festivals I, I would like to, to speak about. So I will show a few pictures uh, just to, 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 to show you uh, what these festivals are and can be. And then I will uh, quickly uh, tell you about the, the, the communities uh, which are involved in these festivals. And maybe if I have a, a bit uh, of time, I will also uh, speak about the consequences of the involvement of the communities for uh, sustainable development, as this is the the um, part, an important part of the uh, Olive for All uh, project. So here is the Provence again. Um, you have uh, you can see. Um, is that? Uh, I don't know if there's well anyway. Uh, you have uh, you have Marseille. Yeah, Marseille. Uh, so you have about uh, Marseille, Avignon, where most of us come from, and Nîmes, Montpellier. So this is the the area uh, where I have worked. And um, um, first example here in Alès, which is in the in the countryside, uh, in the Piedmont, uh, you have um, a gathering, an annual gathering. Uh, La Fête de l'Olive, so fest, olive festival, with uh, uh, people uh, looking at uh, at an old olive tree, and uh, uh, there's going to be a um, well. Um, they 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 are they are there is explanation about uh, about uh, olive trees here, and um, it's more uh, the here it's more the um, the olive growers community who come there to take some uh, information about the cultivation of the olive of the olive tree and here in the park in a park of uh, in, in a park of this uh, city of Alès, you have uh, um, people who uh, uh, look at the stands uh, where um, some information is given about the about the olive and the culture of the of the olive um, and you have some didactic uh, uh, presentation about the different uh, olives from here, the, Les Olives du Gard, so olives from the Gard district, which is uh, near the Gard district, which is a department near Nîmes. Um, and uh, in this, uh, this sub-region of France, uh, it, is, um, it is a place where uh, um, the olive growing is less valorized than uh, in the places I will show you after. So this is a first example, and here another another um, pictures of the same uh, olive festival where you have a collection of uh, olives and the uh, noyau uh, olives collection of olives with a syndicate for the promotion of olive trees in uh, Cévennes, in the Pays Cévenol. Here is another example, uh, very different, of an event, of a cultural event uh, concerning olives. Uh, these images are quite old. It was uh, 15 years uh, ago. Eh? So then I will show you more recent images from other places. But this is a second example in Villeneuve-les-Avignons, so a few uh, kilometers from uh, Avignon. And uh, for a few years, they had uh, they had an exhibition, a cultural event named Les Oléades, uh, 
all he had uh, is a neologism uh, built on the, uh, the, the, the term uh, Olim Olympiad, uh, where uh, here there is a, a light um, and the different games um, in, for children uh, to... Uh, so this is another sort of festival or uh, event to valorize olive and the olive culture. It's more didactic uh, with a, a map of the Mediterranean. Um, this is uh, something to um, enable the visitors to uh, uh, look at the viscosity of the oil and uh, the different uh, material features of the, of the olive oil. And here is an, an olive tree uh, where uh, you can sit around and listen to uh, storytelling. To uh... so this is now a third example is in Nîmes, in the city of Nîmes, in the Gard, uh, les Journées Méditerranéennes de l'Olivier, so the Mediterranean Days for Olive Tree, which were also an important uh, event uh, to valorize olives. Uh, and olive culture in the beginning of the years 2000 until 2010. And here you have uh, uh, eating together the, the famous aioli, uh, which is a, a sauce uh, with garlic and olive oil, which is uh, emblematic from uh, the region, from Provence. So a common uh, way of eating together. Also, um, ephemeral museum. Uh, so we show uh, and we explain uh, the uh, old ways of cultivating uh, olive olive trees and uh, uh, the folkloric uh, brotherhoods, la confrérie des chevaliers de l'olivier, so the chivalry of the olive trees. So this is an interesting feature too. I think this is this might be very French because it is the model from the wine testing uh, brotherhoods, which has been transferred to the olive, uh, to the oil tasting. Um. And now uh, a fourth uh, example, which is La Fête des Olives Vertes, the, the, the festival of green olives in Mouriès. So here uh, the choice has been done. So you see the inter intergenerational uh, feature with the old men looking at the, at the young people from the school, from the local school. And here the emphasis has been put on a technical gesture, which is the, the gesture of crushing the olives, crushing the olives to make uh, green olives to, to, to eat. And this, this gesture is, uh, is a part of the local identity because they have the special recipe of uh, crushing this olive and a special gesture of doing that. And in fact, they do it to uh, get out the, 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 the sour of the, of the olives. Um, you put it in, in the, well, I could give you the recipe if you want. Uh, here, here you see this gesture a bit better with the, with the glass and, and, uh, and, and, the, and the olives. And the, the aim of the competition, the world competition of crushing olives, is to crush the maximum olives in rounds of three minutes. So it is staged, it is on stage in the, in the main street of the village, and they have the, the, these boxes and they, they have to crush the more olives they can. And there is one category with the children, one category with the men, and one category with the, with the women. And uh, the winners of the uh, competition have uh, cups like this, you know, it's on the sport model, uh, and they, they take home uh, olives uh, from, uh, from the syndicate. Uh, in the same festival in Mouriès, May I have five more minutes or four minutes? Three minutes, good. <laughs> uh, in the same, uh, in the same uh, festival, you have uh, olive tree uh, items, uh, wood, wood uh, in wood, uh, which are sold. And you have also a parade, uh, a parade with uh, folkloric uh, costumes here and with uh, olives and carts uh, who go around uh, the streets. So this is an a important point. It's on Sunday morning, and you have every year in September this uh, parade. So here are a few images of the parade with the typical uh, scale, the triangular scale, a chevalet, uh, which is the, 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 uh, the scale we use traditionally in Provence to, uh, uh, to pick up the, the olives. <coughs> so if I... <laughs> come to an end after these examples. 
I take here, uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, on this um, slide, I have listed the different groups of people which are involved in the organization of the festival in Mauriès. So in the last in the last festival, because I have to uh, tell you also that this festival uh, was uh, identified as a intangible cultural heritage festival in the national inventory in, in France. So I, I have uh, written down the file uh, to uh, valorize this festival as a uh, intangible cultural heritage. And here you have the different actors. So the local committee for festivals and the city of Mauriès, the municipality, the millers, the olive growers associations, the trade unions, the olive tree owners, the people producing the olive oil, the local participants who are in the in the who are participating in the parade, the folklore groups, and the external audience, because it is also, uh, of course, open to uh, people, visitors, and 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 tourists. So this is to give you an image of all the. Uh, the uh, the people, all the different uh, groups of people uh, who are involved in uh, in such um, festivals. And just to come to an end, uh, I would like to come back to the general topic of festivals and uh, sustainable development, because in the in the anthropological tradition, festivals are often and events, cultural events, have often been interpreted as a loss of energy, as a waste. There was a moral uh, stance against festivals in the, in history, but uh, however, uh, festivals. Uh, dedicated to the valorization of agricultural products are not only a loss of energy, they are also uh, cultural resources. And that's why, uh, just to finish, in the perspective of sustainable uh, development, I, I uh, point uh, three uh, tracks here. Uh, the, the first is that the festivals can uh, raise the awareness of local traditional knowledge, so knowledge. Uh, second, that they enable people to build new relations with their environment. And three, that they provide a forum where locals and non-locals can meet and, and discuss. So the idea of my presentation is to, to show that uh, we should not oppose tradition and modernity at the end, but really to see how tradition can uh, feed modernity and how tradition can... Uh, uh, bring uh, these uh, issues uh, in the in the frame of uh, sustainable um, development. So thank you. Thank you uh, so much. Thank you. It was a very interesting overview about the special case of France and uh, all the festivals and uh, also the background. Please join us on the stage. And I'm going to call Marion. Berta, she is a teaching and research associate in museology and anthropology in the University of Avignon. And she is going to present um, a work entitled Olive Tree Heritage and Forms of Commitment of the Younger Generation. I just tried to put uh, my um... oh thank you thank you fernanda for the presentation uh, before I, I start, I would like uh, to thank the organizing committee uh, for, of this symposium for their work, and particularly the Greek team who greets us so friendly here in Kalamata. Younger generations, especially teenagers and young adults, are engaged and involved in favor of current matters at local or more international levels. It is well known that these young people, these young generations, are particularly active in the, in the defense and preservation of the environment. The Extension Rebellion and Friday for Future movements bear witness to the creation of, uh, of militant as association in response to the global climate crisis. Similarly, 
in the fields of heritage and culture, many associations and initiatives are being launched by the younger generations in favor of various tangible and intangible heritages. Younger generations are also involved in all older associations. The olive and olive tree heritage, which is at the, uh, the crossroads of environmental and heritage issues, therefore seems to be an appropriate field to study. My presentation today will provide an initial synthesis and compilation of data with, from interviews already conducted by other people involved in the, in the Olive for All project, especially uh, in France. I have relied solely on the resources uh, of this French team, in particular, the, the interviews conducted with the grids dedicated to the, the emotional relationships and children. My analysis is ba was based on different themes, such as transmission, passing generations, and young people involved in for olive tree heritage. It will be interesting to then continue this first work in the future to refine the first results I will present today and perhaps propose parallels with other countries involved in the project. I would like to also warmly thank my colleagues, uh, Julie Doramont, Pauline Grison, Yannick Asquet, Laure Marquis Mourin, and uh, Eric Triquet, as well as Kalis en Engelberg and uh, Yusra Kalis, both interns uh, at the Salagon Museum and Garden, uh, because all of them were very helpful in identifying uh, interviews and completing the first hypothesis I had formulated. My communication starts from an OLO observation made during my first interactions with the students of the uh, Avignon University while they were conducted interviews from, with different stakeholders involved in favor of the olive tree heritage. The question of transmission emerges anonymously and almost systematically as a major stake of these actors. This is particularly the case for actors involved as a, for, on a voluntary basis in, in associations and brotherhoods in particular. For instance, I can quote the Association Oléole, which dedicates to the olive heritage in the region of the Gare in the south of France. Amongst other actions, the members of this association have created teaching materials about olive and olive trees to, um, to transmit those issues to the younger generations in school. The idea of transmission is also formulated by other people representing other, ty other types of actors of the olive heritage, farmers or, or olive professionals, for instance. The Plots of land and thus the olive trees, century and um, century old trees, are wealth, a heritage in a family sense, a legacy passed on from generation to generation, which explains the importance given to the issue of transmission. Individuals who own a few olive trees also expressed transmission as an, an, an import as important in the interviews, such as Nassim Dandani a sociologist by profession and of Tunisian origins who owns five olive trees and talks about them with his children. In this extract, Nassim explains that he received the olive trees from his father, which was a first transmission, and that he often talks to his children about the activities related to those olive trees which can, uh, can relate on a second transmission. However, it should be noted that the people interviewed who define, who define this idea are, as guiding their commitments are from older generations and are already head early. The importance of transmission is underlined by uh, several scholars about heritage, and uh, especially one of one of them that I um, released uh, 
use usually uh, in my work, Jean-Louis Tornator in many of his works. As an anthropologist, Tornator stresses that heritage is a, a collective experience, a form of relationship between world and people. He, he also insists on the fact that heritage is never fixed. It is thought as a process, to, uh, uh, as a, a performative character. Heritage is thought, uh, is thought of in action. Donato stresses also the actualization that happens through trans transmission, and both are interrelated. This anthropologist also uh, worked uh, uh, also worked on the notion of heritage commitment, and it thus defines two levels uh, of commitment uh, for heritage between rather distant decision making bodies and. Uh, thanks to the proliferation of heritage during the, the past decades between local and restricted collectives. These two levels of commitment seems to me very interesting to apprehend uh, in the case of the olive and olive tree heritage, which is particularly plural and subject to various stakes, touristic, economic, environmental, However, I will focus on the second definition in particular to question the place of the young gen generations as actors of the olive tree heritage. Starting from the first observations on the definition of heritage commitment, what about the younger generations? This symposium was organized with three quick questions in mind and that I just repeat here to remind you. What are the forms of patrimonial commitment? Why claim the heritage of the olive tree? And who are the actors linked to the olive tree heritage? In the case of my own study, I, will, I also add a fourth essential question around transmission, which as I first developed is very mobilized. What transmission have the young generations involved received? In return, what form of transmission do they develop to make known, disseminate, and defend the, olive tree, the heritage of the olive tree? From the first interviews conducted, an initial observation was shared by the French members of the Olive Oil Project who are submitting my questions. Despite the omnipresence of the principle of transmission by the emphasis by the actors of the olive and its heritage, the younger generations are underrepresented in the commitment and in the corpus of the interviewees. Several interviewees evoke the, evoked their childhood memories of their parents' olive trees and the help they were able to provide but these are memories. On the other hand, people who own olive trees point out that the olives are collected by the family, which includes the participation of children, as Nassim Dandani mentioned earlier. Children can making of olive oil which some shared in the interviews about their image of the olive tree and the olive and of the olive and the olive tree. Here is an example uh, uh, of an interview conducted with uh, three, six, seven years old children interviewed by two master students from Avignon University. The three children explain how they participate to the collect of the of olives and how we do so. Uh, with and or with uh, with different tools. One of the questions asked to the children uh, during those interviews also concerned their desire to have olive trees later on when they will be adults. Here I present uh, a long answer and especially the one uh, from Julie a pupil of about 10 years old, which is particularly touching and interesting in relation to the subject I study. 
Julie explained here that she would like to have to to have olive trees because she feels it as a tradition to preserve and to keep alive. But can one describe this, these activities as a conscious and artistic commitment? That's an open question on which I don't have the answer yet. On the side of the professional farmers, some of them testified to their doubts as to whether their children would want to take over the family farm because of the difficult conditions to, for farmers today. Estates and olive trees are not taken, so, are not taken over and are sold for, when generations change. For example, Anal Trasic, a 33-year-old restaurant owner in Avignon, recently sold the olive groves that his father had acquired before because of difficulties. However, estates and olive trees are sometimes passed on, or at least this desire is indicated just as uh, on, the, on the screen, where Bernard Trasic, who wears an olive grove on the mill, says that his daughter intends to replace him to keep his olive trees in the family. Another young woman can be mentioned uh, here as she is a kind of exception in the landscape of commitment to the olive tree heritage in the, in the south of France. Paloma Benede Benedetto is 33 years old She's of French of Italian origin and comes from the Cisteron region in the, Alp, in the Alpe de Haute-Provence in the south of France. She studies uh, sustainable tourism, communication and territory development. She was an intern at the Salagon, uh, the, the Salagon Garden and Museum where uh, the, uh, the exhibition about Olive will take place uh, next year. She helps a grandfather who is retired and owns olive trees. As she explains, it is a family activity happening in a relaxed and joyous atmosphere and which she considers important for the ritual place it has in the family. She would like to keep a, a grandfather olive trees as a family attachment. She also stresses the importance of preserving these olive trees, which are already old. Finally, she is also concerned from passing on her, pa her passion and connection with the olive trees to other younger generation, if, even if uh, she did not describe precisely how she would like to do it in the interview that was conducted with her. If everyone agrees on the need to pass on the olive heritage in, all, in order to make it last, the first summary devoted to the commitment of the younger generations show that is, this issue is more complex than it seems. My first synthesis allows us to glimpse the difficulty of intergenerational transmission in the context of these heritages. The younger generations are involved that are involved mainly, sorry, the younger generations are involved mainly, if not exclusively, through a family heritage, which is both material and affective, around the olive tree, but they have not arrived ex nihilo, uh, so to speak, through other experiences in the course of their lives. They rather speak about the transmission they received in the interviews and not the transmission they could do by their own to pass on the, the olive tree heritage. Will the coming generational changes create an imbalance and lack of renewal among olive actors, whether well, they are professionals or amateurs? Is the olive heritage also threatened by a loss of representatives in parallel of aging of the, the different stakeholders. In order to continue a favor near this, this first observation, it would be interesting to conduct a more detailed ethnography 
of the young actors involved in order to better identify better identify them on the one hand and to go and meet them in order to understand their motivations and their, form, uh, their forms of commitment on the other end. This work deserves attention in France, but also in other Mediterranean regions in order to obtain a mapping of the commitment of young generations and to be able to carry out a comparative study. I thank you for your attention. Um, thank you, Marianne. A very important topic, this one also, China's place. So now we are going to have a shared uh, presentation by Joanna Havani and Giorgios. It is difficult. Argyhoyopoulos. I'm so sorry. From the Environment Education Center here in Kalamata. Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to try and read our uh, presentation in order to not to waste our valuable time um, because we have a surprise for you later. So dear all, thank you for attending this symposium. Uh, above all, I would like to thank the organizing committee that invited us and personally to address a special thanks to Mr. Carabatos and Mrs. Cacillet for their cooperation all previous years. Uh, my colleague George and me, Joanna, uh, were public teachers in, um, and we are working in the Envi uh, Environmental Education Center here in Kalamata under the Greek Ministry of Education, one of the 52 relative centers established in Greece. So we are public organizations that aim um, in lifelong learning for environment and sustainability by organizing training seminars for adults and in performing actions of uh, informing and raising awareness to, a local community, to our local community on environment and sustainable development. But our primary target group is the school community, either by training teachers or by facilitating workshops for primary and secondary school pupils from all over uh, the Greece, whereas last year's we have received also Erasmus Project pupils from around Europe. Moreover, we coordinate the relative uh, national educational network called OLIVE since uh, 2003, whose vice president is Mr. Karabatos, and with the participation of other twin environmental education centers of Greece. In fact, we gather the efforts of a subset of the school community that deal with uh, project projects relative to olive trees during a period of two years, either in parallel to their curriculum or in their extra hours. The main topics of this network concern uh, the landscape of the olive grove, the products of the olive tree, and of course, our diet, our Mediterranean diet, our health and the culture of olive. You know better than me what this last topic includes. But let Tell me, let, let me tell you a story as our little boat travels to the sun. Once upon a time, there was a very old olive tree in Athens under the shadow of which Plato is believed to have taught his students 2,400 years ago. When I was born, a bus ran into, and, into it and broke its trunk. The broken part of the tree was then transported to the nearby Agricultural University of Athens and stored in a case. Another story starts during the revolution of Greece against the Ottomans. Ibrahim Pasha chose as his strategy to burn the olive groves here in, Mes here in Messenia, and not only, but some olive trees were saved, one of them in a village nearby. But some year ago, what was left from the olive tree was burned during a local winter festival to warm the guests. But there are other stories with happy ending. For example, an old olive tree was saved in Athens. At Costa Navarino, as mentioned, mentioned here yesterday, 
But what really broke our heart was the intervention of the students of the Vocational School of Astros here in Peloponnese in 2010 to the Minister of Culture and Tourism on the occasion of the uprooting of the old olive tree of Kutrufon. So what do you say? Did they save the tree? It's up to you to say now. Yes, they did. So in Kalamata, also we have a, a very old olive tree. The mother of, Kalam of the Kalamata olive variety survived uh, the devastation of Ibrahim Pasha and gave material for grafting new olive trees. Although it's a mon monument of nature characterized from the Ministry of Culture, its location is not easily accessible to visitors. Here is the um, proof that it is a, a monument of nature characterized. Centuries old olive trees are witnesses of the past, but witness means two things. Witness as a martyr, I suffer, here lies a holiness, and also a deponent, I see and I can tell what happened. They witness the past through their fruit and juices, through their origin, through their taste, and uh, their origin, sorry, their taste here, and through their DNA. All these stories led us to organize an action involving schools, the listing of old olive trees, more than 100 years old, that exist near them. Pupils would record the location, photograph the tree, identify myths, legends, traditions, or stories that exist and are related to olive trees, either from our tradition or by bibliography. Then we plan to examine the genetic material of the trees in order to conclude old Greek olive varieties. Along with this procedure, to make pupils to be aware for, for, of their treasure hidden in the groves near them, near their school. What would be the price of a liter of oil coming from such an olive tree? Schools reacted well, and we have a small collection now of 150 olive trees. I see you some examples here. From all over Greece. The dream was to safeguard these monuments of nature by creating open air museums and designing relative cultural paths. We started here in Messenia from west to central and to east. But common element in all open air museums is the presentation of the exhibit by people related to it and people coming from all social levels hoping that visitors of this centuries old olive trees paths will get to know with the different olive grove landscapes and their special characteristics and reflect on human activities and their impact to the sustainability of our planet. This um, action, this initiative was uh, um, uh, recording these trees um, of uh, the Olive Educational Network was designated by the Ministry of Culture as example of good practice uh, of educational activities for the intangible cultural heritage. But the good news are that the community was also interested in this initiative. During the pandemic, we published the recorded olive trees that existed during the Greek Revolution. And the Captain Vasilis and Carmen Kosadakopoulos Foundation was interested in these recordings and together with the University of Peloponnese and the Agriculture, um, Agricultural University of Athens, we designed an edu educational program for schools called The Tree Speaks, speak about uh, um, you, so you see the date, in order to narrate the events of the revolution in the Peloponnese through a specially designed thematic routes. Also, a national competition was launched where pupils wrote relevant poems, video, and podcasts. The most recent call to young people was the regional student competition Kalamata City as a gastronomic destination through the brand name of Kalamata Olives, 
organized by the team of Mr. Karabatos and the Di Directorate of Education in Peloponnese. Pupils were asked to create their own, own fairy tales or drawings for primary education, and our youngsters could propose their ideas, entrepreneurial or not. This initiative was done under the umbrella of a bigger initiative called Kalamata Olive as a key to sustainable development, where the roots of olive tree try to bring together in cooperation all the stakeholders of the culture of the olive tree. And this is a secret, cooperation. Our words are the children of many people as Seferis, our poet, said. I have mentioned, mentioned many actions, activities, and initiatives before, always with the support of other organizations, institutes, universities, foundations. But, always a but, there is a major challenge. How do we engage youngsters in learning? My colleague will continue our presentation in Greek language for equality reasons. Έτσι λοιπόν, okay. Good morning. Έτσι λοιπόν, η κύρια πρόκληση είναι πώς θα προσελκύσουμε τους νέους. Σήμερα είμαστε εδώ γύρω στα 40 άτομα. Σε δύο εβδομάδες από σήμερα, όλοι μας θα θυμόμαστε μόνο το 20 με 25% αυτών που έχουμε ακούσει και έχουμε δει ως σήμερα. Ως αυτή τη στιγμή. Η συμμετοχή των νέων σημαίνει την ενεργή εμπλοκή τους στη σκέψη, στο σχεδιασμό, στη δημιουργία. Γι' αυτό και οι μέθοδοι διδασκαλίας μας βασίζονται στη βιωματική μάθηση. Όταν μας επισκέπτονται οι μαθητικές ομάδες, χρησιμοποιούμε την έκθεση προϊόντων ελιάς που έχουμε στο κέντρο μας για να μιλήσουμε για αυτά, να τα αγγίξουν, να τα παρατηρήσουν, να δουν τη συσκευασία, τα συστατικά του ελαιόλαδου. Οι μικροί μας φίλοι καλούνται να βρουν διαφορές και ομοιότητες, να κατανοήσουν τη χρήση των υποπροϊόντων της ελιάς. Μερικές φορές φτάνουν να δημιουργήσουν και σαπούνι. Και στο τέλος, οι μαθητές δημιουργούν τέχνη χρησιμοποιώντας τη μοναδική τους φαντασία. Μέσα από μικρές θεατρικές παραστάσεις, οι μαθητές δείχνουν πώς γίνεται η συγκομιδή της ελιάς στο χωράφι, και η επεξεργασία της στο ηλιοτριβείο. Καθώς επισκεπτόμαστε είτε παραδοσιακό είτε σύγχρονο ηλιοτριβείο και παρακολουθούμε εκεί τη διαδικασία παραγωγής του ελαιολάδου. Τραγουδάμε, αγκαλιάζουμε το δέντρο, δημιουργούμε κάτω από τη σκιά του. Για τα παιδιά μεγαλύτερης ηλικίας, τους μαθητές των γυμνασίων και των λυκείων της χώρας, Ελέγχουμε τις φυσικοχημικές παραμέτρους του εδάφου, όπως το pH του εδάφους, την οξύτητα του εδάφους, τη θερμοκρασία του περιβάλλοντος και βέβαια παίζουμε. Εδώ, σε αυτή τη φωτογραφία, σε αυτή τη διαφάνεια, οι μαθητές έχουν κρυφτεί πίσω από τα ελαιόδεντρα. Απολαμβάνουν τη σκιά του δέντρου και χρησιμοποιούν, και χρησιμοποιούν όλες τις αισθήσει τους. Ακόμη και τη γεύση του λαδιού. Σε αυτό, στο τελευταίο, στη γεύση του λαδιού, μας βοήθησε η δράση Σχολατσιό, που εμπνεύστηκε ο πολιτιστικός οργανισμός «Η δρόμη της ελιάς». Ζητούμενο ήταν οι μαθητές να δημιουργήσουν το δικό τους κολατσιό, συνθέτοντας το ψωμί με προϊόντα ελιάς και επιλογές τροφών από τη μεσογειακή διατροφή, όπως λαχανικά και φρούτα. Μιλήσαμε για γεύση. Μιλήσαμε για βιωματική εκπαίδευση. Μιλήσαμε για το μαθαίνω μέσα από την πράξη. Εσάς, σας αρέσει το ψωμί με το λάδι. Γι' αυτό λοιπόν η Ιωάννα τώρα σας φέρνει πιάτα με ψωμί και δύο επιλογές λαδιού. Όποιος επιθυμεί μπορεί να στάξει λίγο λάδι στο ψωμί και να μας πει έπειτα να δοκιμάσει τη γεύση και να μας πει έπειτα την προτίμησή του. Ποιο σας άρεσε, πόσο γευστικό ήταν το καθένα, 
τι συναισθήματα και τι γεύσεις σας δημιουργεί, ποιο θα αγοράζατε αν ήσασταν καταναλωτές, πώς θα το χρησιμοποιούσατε στο καθημερινό σας τραπέζι, ποιο θα επιλέγατε για να χρησιμοποιήσετε στο καθημερινό σας τραπέζι. Μπορεί όποιος θέλει να δοκιμάσει. Σας περιμένουμε. Οι φωτογραφίες που βλέπετε στην διαφάνεια, τα προϊόντα της ελιάς, η πάστα, τα διάφορα είδη ελαιολάδου, είναι το ψωμάκι, είναι από, ακριβώς από τέτοιες δράσεις που κάνει το κέντρο μας. Όταν ε, συναντιόνται οι εκπαιδευτικοί του δικτύου ελιά, του δικτύου περιβαλλοντικής εκπαίδευσης ελιά από όλη την Ελλάδα, ε, στο κέντρο μας ή σε επιλεγμένους ελαιώνες, στα πεδία ε, της μελέτης όπως λέμε, ε, γίνεται ακριβώς αυτή η γευσηγνωσία που βλέπετε και μάλιστα ε, όχι μόνο με λάδια της Μεσσηνίας, αλλά με λάδια που έχουν φέρει από τις διάφορες περιοχές της Ελλάδος. Έτσι ε, έρχονται σε επαφή διαφορετικές πληθυσμιακές ομάδες, αντιπρόσωποι από διαφορετικές πληθυσμιακές ομάδες της Ελλάδος, έρχονται σε επαφή, ε, γίνεται η ανταλλαγή των ε, γεύσεων ε, στα ελαιόλαδα και συμβαίνει ε, ελαιόλαδα της μιας περιοχής της Ελλάδος να συναντιόνται και να συζητούν και να συνομιλούν με άλλες περιοχές της Ελλάδος. Ε, τα ελαιόλαδα της Κρήτης με την Κέρκυρα, τα ελαιόλαδα της Μυτιλίνης με τη Μεσσηνία, διαφορετικές ποικιλίε, διαφορετικές εμπειρίες ανθρώπων, άνθρωποι που κουβαλάνε διαφορετική, ε, διαφορετική, διαφορετικά βιώματα από την ελιά και το λάδι, ε, άνθρωποι που ε, έχουν παιδιά στα σχολεία τους και οι οποίοι ε, προσπαθούν να δώσουν ό,τι περισσότερο και ό,τι καλύτερο στις μικρές ηλικίε πάνω στην, ε, στον πολιτισμό της ελιάς και στην κληρονομιά της ελιάς και να ανταλλάξουν μεταξύ τους πληροφορίες, εμπειρίες, κάτι που ε, γίνεται και αυτή τη στιγμή εν μέρη εδώ στην αίθουσα, συνάδελφοι και φίλοι μας από την Πορτογαλία, από τη Γαλλία, συμπατριώτες μας Έλληνες. Βλέπω ότι αυτή τη στιγμή τα πρόσωπά σας είναι ενθουσιασμένα κατά κάποιο τρόπο. Νιώθω ότι η γεύση της γλώσσας και του στόματος και του, ε, ε, περνάνε αυτή τη στιγμή στο, ε, στο DNA σας. Ναι. Με αυτό τον τρόπο λοιπόν προσπαθούμε να περάσουμε τα μηνύματα στη νέα γενιά, στους μαθητές μας από τις μικρότερες μέχρι τις μεγαλύτερες ηλικίε και να τους κάνουμε να ζήσουν τα βιώματα, να καταλάβουν πολύ έντονα το συνέστημα του λαδιού και της ελιάς, γιατί η γεύση βγάζει, τη στιγμή της γεύσης βγαίνουν συναισθήματα, βγαίνουν βιώματα, βγαίνουν στην επιφάνεια πάρα πολλά από αυτό που θέλουμε εμείς στην παιδαγωγική διαδικασία. 
Να ζητήσω από τον ηχολήπτη μας να μας ανοίξει, να ακούσουμε λίγο, αλλά όχι πολύ δυνατά, το βιντεάκι αυτό. Ορίστε, πρέπει να το βάλω σε εσά. Να το βάλω σε εσά. Οκ. Okay. Κλαδί ελιά κρατούσε. So, this is uh, from uh, our music, music school of Kalamata, uh, a project uh, long time ago. Θα σα τα λέω και στα ελληνικά για να μην χρειαστεί να κάνετε την μετάφραση. Είναι από το μουσικό σχολείο Καλαμάτα πριν πάρα πολλά χρόνια, το 2013 νομίζω. Uh, ça vient de notre école de musique de Kalamata. C'est un projet très très vieux. It says that uh, olive oil, the black eye, as we say, the olive oil, uh, as a beautiful lady, has uh, chosen uh, to live only in Kalamata. To say to stick to the phrase, that means that the olive oil has chosen to live here because it is beautiful, it is jolly, it is black eye, the black eye. Σε la variété de Kalamata uh, Olive. Uh, νομίζω είναι αρκετά, γιατί... Uh, so, um, I will try to make uh, both languages in order not to have the headphones uh, now that the, the results will uh, come. Θα μιλάω και στις δύο γλώσσες τώρα για να, έχουμε, uh, να μην έχετε τα ακουστικά στα αυτιά σας συνέχεια και σε λίγο που θα συνεχίσουμε την παρουσίαση και θα την τελειώσουμε. Um, What did you choose? Did you choose? Did you select it? Lipon, no, she selected it. If if your A is your preferable, and the alpha is your preferable, just para calos y costa heria. You can raise your hands. All right, all right, okay. Calitera, better to raise the hands the B team, those that like the B. Bad news, bad news. Keep them down. Valte takato ta heria. So we are not going to show you. The Thasas Dixume, the etiquette the, of the these etiquettes of the olives. You understand why? But just to tell you, Thasas Pume Mono Oti, that um, the first olive, the A team, is an extra virgin in extra Partheno from our region, from our uh, Messiniaki Union. In uh, Apotin Apotin Messiniaki, though. And the B is um, a product with. Uh, Now you uh, maybe they can help me in tr translating. Exevientismena uh, ladia, several raffiné, raffiné oil. So so B team, you are A now, okay? I'm, I I I will not I will not tell who raised the head, the B the B hand. It was a bread. 
so let's continue because we are not out of time. Yes, yes, we are out of time, all right? So there are some criteria, and we, we tell people about these criteria. Only one last thing in order to pass to the next uh, um, presentation. Don't forget that engaging youngsters, you need to know youngsters. So most of us are in the middle and from me, not in the middle from there. We're generation, not alpha, not Z, not, we are past, past generations. And they have all characteristics and they have all learning styles. And this is the most important that I have to show you from all these big um, uh, slide is the circle over there that says that their learning style, in order to approach kids, you need to be virtual, in a virtual um, environment. You don't have to be the teacher that talks. You have to be co-creator with the kids. And this is what I hope that uh, um, uh, the next uh, team that will present, uh, uh, the next presentation will show us a virtual world about uh, a uh, platform about uh, uh, Olive Tree. Thank you very much. Merci. Thank you. Thank you. Obrigada. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So to continue, um, we are going to listen to Stelios Vasilopoulos that is going to present a communication that was uh, elaborated also with Yulia Fertazu, Maria Puri, Itanasis Korakis, um, uh, all from the University of the Peloponnese and Stelios comes from the University of Thessaly. Okay, and the communication is uh, entitled The Heritage of the Olive Tree in the Digital World Through Participatory Practices, the Olive for All Crowdsourcing Platform. Thank you, Fernanda. Uh, until we um, fix the technical thing here, I would like to say that uh, I'm not really Greek as was obviously, you know, as became obvious from the olive tasting event. I'm actually a clone and an alien coming from away. And I will not say these results to my husband, who is an olive oil producer, uh, for, uh, you know, as an uh, amateur. And I will not reveal how ashamed his wife feels right now. Uh, a second point I would like now to say is that um, uh, I'm really sorry that our presentation follows uh, the <laughs> uh, the one before. And had I known that you will be presenting such a beautiful event, we would have presented before you. So I will now bring you back to you know the tiresome reality of hearing some theory again. Uh, so I will try very short, I will begin the presentation trying very shortly to present the theoretical framework that supports uh, uh, the participative platform that will be developed within the framework of uh, our project. Uh, I will try to be really succinct. Uh, if you have any questions afterward, please feel free to uh, to 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 set them. And uh, then Iulia and Stelios will talk more about the participative platform. Only for All is funded in the framework of JPI's Strategic Research and Innovation Agenda 2020. And this agenda builds on the policy developments within and outside Europe and addresses the political, economic, sociocultural and technological changes occurring worldwide. Accordingly, JPI sets four priority areas to which Only for All adheres, as I will explain. It is quite significant <clears throat> that the two first priority areas concern the promotion of participative governance models in the field of cultural heritage, while prioritizing digital technologies and stressing the added value of heritage. But what is participative governance? Participative governance in the field of heritage describes policies and efforts which aim to encourage every sector of society to own and share responsibility for their heritage. 
accordingly. Also, bottom-up stakeholders like NGOs, civil society organizations, the voluntary sector, and interested citizens should be encouraged to become involved in decision-making, planning, implementation, and evaluation of heritage policies and programs. This bottom-up involvement in the governance of heritage supports cultural democracy, which is a main EU aim ever since the 1970s. Still unreached, of course, but ongoing uh, main aim. Accordingly, since 2005 and the Faro Convention, uh, participative heritage governance is being increasingly promoted by a number of EU texts and initiatives. Participative governance also underpins the EU strategic aims for growth and employment, as well as the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Coming back to the JPI framework of Olive for All, Priorities three and four consider cultural heritage in a changing demographic and territorial context. The big challenge here is how can the cultural and the natural heritage become a lever for sustainable development, taking into account both the benefits, but also the threats created for this heritage, as well as the impact of the environmental changes on heritage. With these priorities, JPI promotes a holistic approach to heritage, encouraging interdisciplinary and innovative research to meet today's challenges and contribute to sustainable development. At the core of all these initiatives lies public participation and engagement, made possible also through technological solutions. Olive for All fits in this framework, putting the olive heritage at the epicenter. Research on this heritage, as we heard in this symposium, looks into the olive heritage contribution and many value aspects, but also its various stakeholders and different ways this heritage is perceived and transmitted. Indeed, in the field of the olive heritage, we can discern a number of stakeholders. Indicatively, UNESCO, as we heard, has recognized the Mediterranean diet and select olive festivals, as Mr. Fournier said before, as world heritage. While regimes are already in place, as the Portuguese team uh, presented, to protect olives, olive groves, and even olive products. So we heard about this from other speakers in this symposium. The olive heritage is also becoming an important element of branding regions and municipalities, promoting olive tourism and agrotourism, contributing to local economic prosperity, environmental protection, and social cohesion. So these are the, the main sustainable development goals. Furthermore, a number of foundations and non-profit institutions are already promoting the olive heritage through thematic museum, education and awareness projects, as we uh, just experienced, or through olive tree routes, which foster intercultural dialogue. Naturally, businesses and markets flourish on the olive heritage depending on well-established practices, as well as forms of alternative tourism, but also, as we heard by Joao, on the industrialization of olive production with uh, the uh, threats and the risks arising for the olive production. At a smaller scale, olive also stimulates new entrepreneurial ideas which support local economies and the livelihood of smaller communities. And last, but certainly not least, people are perhaps the most important stakeholder concerning the olive heritage, since this heritage is preserved and develops thanks to the long-lived rituals and social practices people perform, as already explained in other sessions. The Olive for All platform seeks to tap into the people's memories, sensations, experiences, and perceptions, and offer them a tool to record in a digital format this living, intangible, very personal, 
but also communal heritage so as to preserve it and share it with the world. With Olive for All, this can be now made possible through crowdsourcing using digital technologies, more on which you shall now hear from Iulia. Thank you. So let me present, uh, share with you uh, the logic, uh, our ideas behind, behind uh, the design of uh, this uh, platform. And uh, I will uh, start uh, this uh, presentation with a short story. A few years ago, I saw a Spanish film with the following plot. In a small village in Spain, a Mediterranean landscape full of olive trees, the inhabitants live from the cultivation and sale of olive oil. Hard work, completely dependent on market fluctuations. So they collectively decide, pressured by the youth of the village, to sell their land to an investment company. The first thing the company does is transplant a centenarian olive tree to the terrace of a mall. The site of the centenarian olive tree in the heart of the shopping center as an attraction awakens the young villagers who claim the return of the olive tree to its natural place. Of course, this is a, a quite a melodramatic uh, scenario, uh, but uh, I would like to convey the meaning of uh, the story to the context of our symposium. These films show us how the inhabitants of a village become aware of and claim their cultural heritage. This goes very well with the aim of our research program, as Julie very nicely put it yesterday, and that is sustainable development through the realization of the importance, but also the opportunities of traditional cultivations, such as the olive. Traditional cultivations are associated with a whole way of life, which is transmitted to generations, keeping heritage alive. Cultural heritage is a lever for sustainable development. This very connection between the cultural heritage and the preservation and development of local economies has now been integrated in the cultural policies of states and organizations as Vili Fotopoulos' presentation showed us yesterday. So, at the core of the program is the understanding of heritage as a living heritage. The notion of living cultural heritage is critical because it brings people to the forefront. It focuses on the people who live, experience, preserve, transform cultural heritage. In this context, the goal of the program is to strengthen the bearers of uh, cultural heritage and to find ways to involve the communities related to the, to the olive culture and to learn from them, but also to enhance the communities to become aware of the importance of this heritage. And when we are talking about people's engagement, when we are talking about people's engagement, Digital technology is the right tool. So the research program is based on the connection between cultural heritage and digital technology. Does it sound like a weird connection? Can digital technology be used in order to raise awareness about sustainable development through heritage? Digital technology enables us to store large amounts of information, interconnect different kinds of information, create network of users, make various products for different users and for different uses. Seeking to take advantage of all these benefits of digital technology, our aim is to create a multifunctional platform suitable for organizing, preserving, and presenting different kinds of information on olive heritage. These are the standard characteristics of every kind of digital repository. 
The novelty of our platform is its conceptualization as a participatory mechanism. How does this participatory mechanism function? The design platform is suitable for the organization of various kinds of information related to the olive culture collected by the three countries participated in the program. Monuments, museums, olive groves, know-how, festivals, traditions, songs, tools, and so on. The novelty of the platform is that it is designed as a participatory mechanism, as I said before. That means that it is not just for researchers and scientists. It is also addressed to stakeholders, farmers, traders, olive pickers, craftsmen, consumers, etc. So we create a digital environment suitable for a wide audience, and in this environment, people are asked to record olive groves and landscapes, mill and factories, tools and cultivation practices, stories, recipes, songs, and much more. And the most important thing, in this environment, people are asked to record their personal experience in relation to the olive tree. That means that the participatory platform allows people to share their personal knowledge and experience regarding olive culture. In that way, the platform imprints the living heritage and it functions in multiple ways. It creates a common digital space for collaboration between scientists and society. It allows people to share their personal knowledge and personal experience giving them a voice and make them visible. It collects all this material and returns it, return it to the society, creating various applications, as Telios will later tell us. In this way, the participatory platform is designed as a mechanism of engagement. The idea behind the design of this platform is that we must hear the living experience of the stakeholders. In order to discover something new, we must study the old. To, in to invent methods for future sustainable changes, we must record and understand the past. As Georgos Kokinos told us yesterday, tradition should not hold us back in the past, but show us the way to the future. That means that each generation must rediscover a creative way to live heritage, a way based on knowledge and creative ideas about performing heritage. Only for All will propose some creative ideas based on the participatory platform, as Telios will now tell us. Hello, everyone. As uh, you can see, we're getting more and more uh, presenting uh, presentations here. <laughs> Um, as far as uh, the previous um, experience we had with the presentation, uh, I'll certainly remember it. I kept on uh, eating some bread there. My clothes actually will remember it as well. Um, I'll uh, have the third bit of uh, this uh, presentation, which is uh, quite short and quite um, um, uh, easy and, and practical. Um, the purpose of uh, the Olive for All platform is to highlight, support, and promote the role of uh, the olive tree heritage um, and the role of its actors uh, in the three countries involved, that is France, Portugal, and Greece. It uh, also, as an extension, aims in uh, bringing this activity to other countries in the Mediterranean basin and uh, everywhere, everywhere else, of course, that uh, it, um, it can work. Um, one of uh, the main objectives of this platform is to develop uh, 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 to develop uh, of the project sorry is to develop a participatory platform uh, as mentioned by Maria and Julia. Um, and this platform will give voice to scientists initially, but mainly the wider public in the long run to share their experiences and knowledge um, through digital tools, modern tools that allow better communication, um, to uh, 
um, uh, better communication of information, efficient interaction between stakeholders and fruitful synergy creation within the value chain of the olive tree. Hence, the platform will provide three main tools, a digital knowledge database, where people are able to acquire information on several expressions of the importance of the olive tree heritage, an upload function um, which will allow the addition of new information uh, into the database and interactive maps with uh, points of interest in the monitored areas of the three countries uh, that will allow the creation of cultural paths and routes for travelers who wish to um, create a trip and organize a trip to these areas. This will be achieved with the hard work of all scientific teams in various levels from field surveys to data collection and management and from the development of digital tools to the platform management. To achieve this, the development of uh, such a multi-operational platform, various technical tools will be used, um, such as the uh, ones that you can see, uh, Postgres and Mapbox and all that, which are outside the scope of this symposium. And I'm sure that uh, after a busy morning and afternoon uh, would only make you feel like trying to uh, understand the deeper meaning of the matrix. So we move on to the practicalities and um, this is of interest, what it looks like uh, in its uh, initial steps right now. Um, you can get a visual idea of, um, of uh, the platform being re developed right now with the basic functions of registering, uh, creating your account and accessing it, um, and then inserting points of interest uh, according to uh, initially to scientific data, and then uh, that can be passed on the public, um, where cultural routes will be able to be created or chosen from ready ones. Over the next period, we will be completing the development of the platform. We will be inputting uh, scientific information and we will be making, making it available in the, to the public. So hopefully creating um, a new route in the olive tree heritage, the olive for all route. And that is for me, thank you very much. Stellus and colleagues, uh, I think that it was it will be good for you to join us. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Is in fact a very important tool regarding sustainability because it's very important to communicate and share knowledge, and this tool enables us to do that. So, I ask Yulia. And um, Maria and Julie. So hello, uh, for this, for this uh, last uh, presentation, we are delighted uh, to present the exhibition project. As a reminder, the exhibition project that is being organized as part as this research program is part of uh, Olive for Hall's work package too, and therefore aims to raise awareness of the value of the olive trees heritage. This exhibition, um, will be held at the Salagon Museum in Man in the Alps of uh, Haute-Provence from uh, 20th May 2023 for approximately one year. 
The framework of the exhibition, the sensory and digital devices, can be reused later for an exhibition in Portugal or Greece in a traveling logic. The choice of Salagon Museum, uh, there are many reasons, uh, the exhibition is fully in line with the strategic and the cultural projects of the Salagon Museum, which has the characteristic of being a listed historic monument in a Renaissance priory with a church dating from the Romanesque period and the 19th century buildings. A museum of uh, the departmental council label as a Musée de France, Museum of France and the uh, remarkable gardens. A museum specializing in ethnobotany and uh, an ethnopole which benefits from a label created in 1996 by the Ministry of Culture, awarded to cultural institution, conducting a policy of excellence in research, information, and cultural action around the intangible cultural heritage. The rooms for the exhibition, uh, the temporary exhibition rooms cover an area of uh, three meters square meters in the former barn of the Priory. They are therefore spread over two levels in the same building with two rooms per level. These rooms have just undergone a major renovation which has just been completed. The project team, three there are three exhibition curators. Anthony Chabert is the director of the museum, Edouard Delobry uh, from the museum and Julie. An exhibition project team with uh, many of the members of the French team are indispensable in the construction of the exhibition, Eric Triquet, Marion Bertin, Pauline Grison, Laure marchis Mouren, and myself. And we also, to, to mention the time, time line, uh, timely contribution of uh, all Olive uh, for all members. Much of the, the information and the data from this conference and your work will be valuable for the exhibition. So the exhibition project, the main uh, objective of the exhibition is to raise awareness among the public of the symbolic, historical and economic value of the olive trees heritage. The exhibition is driven by the following statement of intent, what is heritage? Our idea is, to is that the exhibition should not resemble existing, existing exhibition that take the, the olive tree or olive or their fame or focus primarily on olive oil production techniques. On the contrary, it should highlight the multiple dimension and issues related to the olive tree heritage. The idea is to show that heritage is a social construction. Men and women consider the olive tree and its products as an heritage. They decide to safeguard and defend this heritage inherited from their ancestors. Some elements are therefore excluded from this heritage process, other are much more valued. Three principles are central to the design of this exhibition. First of all, the popularization of science. The exhibition will reflect as much as possible the investigations carried out within the framework of the Olive Oral project in the three countries of the project. It will highlight various methodologies and fields in order to emphasize the comparative approach taken in the framework of the project. The objects, photographs, and testimonies will therefore come from the three countries of the project, even if a focus on the art de Haute Provence, where the Salagon Museum is located, is required. Uh, second one, the narrative. The exhibition aims to give an important place to narration, that is to say, the storytelling proposed to the visitor. This narrative will be built 
from the speeches and testimonies of olive tree professionals, arboriculturists, professional olive growers, but also private individuals who own a few olive trees, lover of this tree and its products of the landscapes that olive trees shape. Thus, in this exhibition, the idea is to put into space a strong link that unites the local populations to the olive tree, a link that is essentially emotional. It is this emotional dimension that the visitor will be made to feel. Sensitivity is also achieved through object stories. It is therefore a question of using a collection of objects made before the exhibition to present objects and associated testimonies. Third principle, sensory education tools. The exhibition in the, is designed to awaken the visitor's five senses. A series of successive devices will be proposed, which will notably require the contribution of contemporary artists. <clears throat> the idea is to intersperse the discourse with sensory medi mediation devices or sensory works of art, which are completely integrated into the exhibition and not juxt juxtaposed with the exhibition's purpose. The indications given here are the result of reflections already begun. They can be completed by new proposals. The few uh, will be uh, supported, for example, by photographs and videos. Some of them are already existing and to be produced. We want to show the maps of heritage points of interest that come from the work package one, from documentary research and the citizen digital device. The sense of smell will be stimulated by devices designed with Thierry Talou, a chemist and researcher in Toulouse and his team. Sensory analysis of oils and creation of stable odors to build smells. Thanks to the colleagues of the three uh, three countries a wide range of oils with defects or oils from greece france portugal but, but also frying oils uh, will be uh, uh, shown the sound will be stimulated by sound cre creation by julie faubert a canadian artist on the process of preparing olive oil she will uh, she will show uh, different actions from the harvest to the oil. The reflection on touch will be depend from the tools and equipment from the pre preparation of olive oils. Taste can be experimented with an herbal tea made from olive leaves and with workshops offered from time to time. The objects, it's an exhibition where the discourses take precedence over the object. Nevertheless, some objects, some objects will be shown in the exhibition. At this stage, we haven't not yet chosen the objects we will show. We, will show. we have a choice of several museum collections that include objects dedicated to the olive in France. Uh, we have collection from um, Salago Museum, from the Musem, and from the Musée Arlatan in, uh, in Arles, but also some uh, loan, loan of the collection of uh, Musée de l'Olivier in Volks, and some also loan of objects from the survey by uh, stakeholders. There, there are various types of objects, advertisements, labels, postcards and posters, technical up, Objects for the preparation of olives and olive oil, tableware dedicated to tasting, and so on. Works of art. We, we would also like to show the public some photographs lent by the creator of the cosmetics brand L'Occitane and uh, of Olive, Olivers and Co., Olivier Bosson. Uh, he created also the Olive Tree Museum in Volks. They have been taken by great photographers of the VIEW Photography Agency. 
like uh, photographers like uh, Isabelle Munoz, François Xavier Emery, you can see uh, the, the photograph, um, Paolo Nozzolini, Denis Deyo, etc. There are photographs taken on the Mediterranean Rim, which are magnificent and which give an account of the multiple dimensions of the heritage of the olive tree. Trees and landscape, humans, gathering and technical actions, rituals and the religious traditions. The museographic proposal. The speech of our exhibition is articulated in four teams. First of all, the heritage in representations. The first one is dedicated so to the images of the olive tree. Our objective is to construct a discourse on representations to show what fits the common imagination of the audience. This room must be designed in two stages, immersion in the representations and as, as a support point to introduce the exhibition. We'll explore some subtopics <clears throat> which are existing types of representations, Mediterranean landscapes, food products, tourist make markers, and the olive tree as a symbol of peace, longevity, victory, wisdom, and so on. Second one, the heritage as an emotional and identity-based heritage and transmission. The, the second part of the exhibition is dedicated to transmission, and our goal is to show that transmission is at the heart of the heritage dimension, and that it induces a particular emotional and identity link. These are subtopics uh, we want to show in uh, our exhibition, transmissions of techniques and know-how, festivals, rituals and religions, emotional bond, micro-territorial anchoring or attachment. So the third one. <laughs> the third one, the uh, heritage of the olive tree in today's world, a shaken up heritage. Uh, our objective is to start from the observation of the world worldwide expansion of the olive tree and the overconsumption of olive oil all over the world to show the, th the threats to the heritage, but also the new approaches to re-evaluation that this brings about in, in uh, response, thus introducing room four. Our sub-themes are observation, the olive tree outside its border uh, in China, Japan, uh, Australia, and, uh, and other countries, the over-exploitation with intensive agriculture, fraud and diversion, ornamental olive trees, etc., and new quality approaches in reaction to globalization and new tourism issues, landscape value but at the risk of the, a certain uniformity. And the fourth one, shared heritage, a living heritage as a, a support for innovation developed by new communities of actors. Our objective in these four, four rooms is to show the potential for innovation allowed and carried by the great diversity of actors who have taken hold of this heritage with the wealth and of action linked uh, to the intrinsic, in, intrinsic dimension of the olive trees, which induces sociability and the awareness of the challenges of sustaina sustainability. This room should also provide a return to the visitor echoing the introduction. We want to have an entry by types of actor uh, illust illustrated each time by concrete innovation, action or products in response to a constraint or a particular issue, uh, like uh, researchers, professional, like Oliver growers, millers, chefs, manufacturers, isolated amateurs, association, ecotourism, actors, artists, and so on. We want to highlight the potential for sociability linked to the olive tree, a virtuous circle, the sustainable development dimension of this valorization, prospective dimen dimension, imagining the olive tree landscape in a 2050 
And um, finally, we want to address the visitor directly again by asking for testimonies, evocation, and by offering content like uh, recipes, advice, maps of point of interest, and other museums in the territory surrounded uh, heritage sites. And this is a presentation of our exhibition in progress. It's opening in May 2023. It would be nice if this exhibition could be given elsewhere. And we hope also to see many of you there. We will be, of course, happy to answer your questions. If you Thank, like. you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Before we uh, initiate the polls and remarks, I think that we have some moments, uh, some minutes to uh, a brief discussion. So, please, if you have any questions. Thank you very much for this nice uh, session. Um, it's a lot of th uh, different things that I, I wanted to ask, but it's complicated. So I uh, resume in a practical inquiry to uh, Julie about how to uh, prom continue this exhibition in other countries. What will be the procedure? Uh, what will be the, the criteria? Uh, to make connection between museums and so on? Uh, there are no criteria. Uh, you, you are free to, to do what you want to do. Um, we are, uh, it was mandatory in this program to do one exhibition. Uh, we don't have uh, to do other ones, uh, but it would be great uh, as we have uh, done all this, uh, this work uh, to reuse it, them uh, in other, ex other exhibitions. I think um, all the devices um, uh, uh, can be reused uh, the, not, um, in, uh, in other exhibition. The, the, the best would be to use uh, objects uh, from uh, Greece or from Portugal, if uh, if uh, there was an exhibition in uh, in Greece or Portugal. Ah, this is a question because the, this is the issue of own ownership of the materials. Yes. Yes. Okay, but uh, it's, uh, we have to decide to to inform about what can be delivered. Yes. And what not. Yes, okay. yes, yes. You, you, you are free to, to do that. Um, uh, we, we didn't add uh, the time to, to notice it, but uh, Edouard de Lobry uh, went uh, to Portugal uh, maybe two months ago and uh, he, he bought uh, some objects uh, from uh, Portugal. Yeah. Uh, for uh, the the museum, the, the museum uh, collection in Marseille, so uh, we have already in France objects from Greece uh, and from Portugal because uh, there was uh, also um, uh, a big uh, survey in uh, 2003 and four uh, for from the museum and for the museum uh, in Greece. So we have, but. Um, the, the, I uh, I wanted to uh, you maybe to to take objects from your country because it's expensive to uh, to 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 transport uh, the objects. It, it was only the, 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 the interest. Just one more. and uh, the principle is uh, you can have the frame. Um, yes, the 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 framework of the exhibition and you choose your, your object. Yes, as Kada has the lona Sinharo yet in your ganos is yet a Yaftabu Matha Mesmete Hordas. Σαν ακροατές στο 
στο συνέδριο αυτό ή στο συμπόσιο. Ε, θέλω να ρωτήσω κάτι. Θα μπορούσε ένας φορέας όπως ο Δήμος Καλαμάτας να, να συμμετάσχει κάπως ή στέλνοντα κάτι σε αυτό το μουσείο γιατί η Καλαμάτα είναι συνειφασμένη με την ελιά και τη, όχι ως παραγωγική διαδικασία και ως τοπίο. Έτσι. Θα μπορούσε να υπάρχει κάποια τέτοια συμβολή ή πώς μπορεί ένας φορέας να, να βοηθήσει σε αυτό. Ευχαριστώ. Ευχαριστούμε για αυτό το ενδιαφέρον που δείχνετε και ουσιαστικά ε, αυτό είναι και ο στόχος και της παρουσίασης της πλατφόρμας, δηλαδή η συμμετοχή ε, μπορεί να γίνει ακριβώς μέσα από τη συμμετοχική πλατφόρμα την οποία ε, παρουσιάσαμε λίγο το σκεπτικό της στην αρχή ε, για να δείξουμε, δηλαδή στα, σταθήκαμε περισσότερο στην ιδέα ε, που είχαμε στην αφετηρία μας για την πλατφόρμα ακριβώς για να δείξουμε το ενδιαφέρον για τη συμμετοχή όλων των ε, ανθρώπων, των φορέων οι οποίοι ασχολούνται με την ε, ε, κουλτούρα της ε, ελιάς Οπότε, ε, μέσα από τη συμμετοχή σας στην πλατφόρμα και με, με πολύ ευχαρίστηση, δηλαδή, μπορείτε να βάλετε, ε, να προσθέσετε υλικό που μπορεί και όλες να χρησιμοποιηθεί για διαφορετικούς τρόπους, όπως και για την έκθεση για την οποία μας, ε, ε, μας μίλησε η Ζουλίκη Σιλβή. Και επίσης να, να προσθέσουμε εδώ ότι στο πλαίσιο του αυτού του project κάτι που δεν φάνηκε ίσως τόσο πολύ είναι ότι διεξάγονται μία σειρά ποιοτικών αλλά συνεντεύξεων ε, σε επιλεγμένους θα λέγαμε εκπρο... stakeholders, ομάδες συμφερόντων και βέβαια ένα κομμάτι που πρέπει να ερευνηθεί είναι και ε, οι θεσμικοί, θα λέγαμε, φορείς, δηλαδή αυτοί που θέτουν το, την πολιτιστική πολιτική, την τοπική αναφορικά με την ελιά. Οπότε και εκεί πέρα η συνδρομή σα και φορέων, έτσι όπως το Κέντρο Εκπαίδε, Περιβαλλοντικής Εκπαίδευσης και βέβαια του Δήμου Καλαμάτας, είναι σημαντική η συμβολή δηλαδή της, της, ε, 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 της οπτικής του Δήμου πάνω στο κομμάτι της σημασίας της ελιάς για την αεφόρο ανάπτυξη, για την τουριστική ανάπτυξη και ούτω καθεξής. Οπότε και εκεί πέρα θα μας επιτρέψετε να σας χτυπήσουμε την πόρτα και να, έτσι και στο επιμελητήριο κύριε Γκρέκη και να πάρουμε την ε, θεσμική, θα λέγαμε, οπτική για να συμπληρώσει τις από τα κάτω ε, οπτικές που μπορεί να δείξει και η συμμετοχική πλατφόρμα. And to answer, uh, and to answer more pre pre precisely uh, for the museum uh, question, um, I think uh, you could uh, send us a recipe or a testimony, uh, who, who could be, which could be great in our exhibition, or uh, send you send us um, uh, olive cans or I. Some uh, some uh, stuff that uh, are linked uh, to the olive uh, oil, of course, and olive tree, and uh, you would uh, share with us, of course, and the visitors in France. I θέλω με κάποιο προβληματισμό θέλω να τον μεταφέρω σε σας. Δεν είναι ερώτηση, αλλά είναι ένας προβληματισμός. Όπως ξέρετε στην στον κόσμο και στη Μεσόγειο και παντού υπάρχει ένα τεράστιο θέμα, όπως ορίζει και, η, και μάλιστα πολύ, είναι το μόνο πράγμα που κάνει η Αμερική πολύ σωστά, είναι το θέμα της πνευματικής ιδιοκτησίας. Ήθελα λοιπόν να ρωτήσω, πώς θα προστατευτούν οργανισμοί, φορείς, που έχουν δείξει μια ιδιαίτερη κινητικότητα στα θέματα που συζητάμε, στα θέματα που θα προκύψουν στην πορεία μέσα από την πλατφόρμα, όπως το Κέντρο Περιβαλλοντικής Εκπαίδευσης, πώς δηλαδή σκέπτεστε να προστατεύσετε Ανάλογε πρωτοβουλίε. Ένα αυτό. Πώ θα τι προβάλλετε. Δεύτερον αυτό. Και τρίτον, πώ δεν θα γίνουν πράγματα 
επαναλαμβανόμενα. Δηλαδή, θα υπάρχει κάποιο φίλτρο ώστε να μην έχουμε ξανά επαναλήψεις. Γιατί ε, ξέρετε ότι μέσα σε αυτή την ψηφιακή εποχή ε, πολλές φορές ε, ένας φορέας κλέβει την ιδέα του άλλου. Και έχουμε λοιπόν μια σειρά από εκδηλώσεις αλλά που στην ουσία είναι τα ίδια πράγματα αλλά με ένα άλλο σκεπτικό. Με ένα άλλο σκεπτικό. Άρα λοιν λοιπόν, είναι, δεν είναι ερώτηση, είναι παρατήρηση λίγο πολύ. Ότι πρέπει να τα λάβετε σοβαρά υπόψη αυτά τα πράγματα για του λόγου που σα εξήγησα. Ευχαριστώ. Ναι. Αυ... Αυ... Αυτό. Ε, αυτά ακριβώς είναι, ε, στο, είναι μέσα στον προβληματισμό και όχι μόνο το δικό μας, αλλά γενικότερα συνδέονται με την ε, ψηφιακή συνθήκη. Ε, το ζήτημα της, ε, πρώτα πρώτα υπάρχει το ζήτημα ε, της ας πούμε διαφύλαξης της προστασίας προσωπικών δεδομένων ε, και της, το copyright των πνευματικών δικαιωμάτων όπου ε, αφενός εκεί θα υπάρχει κάποιο πρωτόκολλο συνεργασίας ακολουθώντας ε, την νομική οδό, δηλαδή ε, ακριβώς τους κανόνες που υφίστανται ε, σε σχέση με αυτά τα ζητήματα. Αυτό είναι το ένα. Το δεύτερο όμως και πιο σημαντικό ε, θεωρώ, δηλαδή αυτό το βρίσκω ένα λίγο τεχνικό θέμα, σημαντικό αλλά τεχνικό. Αυτό όμως που θεωρώ σημαντικό είναι ότι αυτή η πλατφόρμα δεν ανήκει σε κάποιον Δηλαδή, το κέντρο περι... ε, είναι ακριβώς ένα είδος, δικτύου, ένα είδος δικτύου φορέων και ανθρώπων όπου η συμμετοχή στην πλατφόρμα αναδεικνύει τις ιδιαίτερες πρωτοβουλίες. Άρα, δηλαδή, ε, ε, κατά τη γνώμη μας, ένας φορέας, ας πούμε, όπως το Κέντρο Περιβαλλοντικής Εκπαίδευσης, θα αναδειχθεί μέσα από την συμμετοχή, θα γίνει πιο γνωστό, θα ενταχθεί μέσα σε ένα δίκτυο γνωριμιών και ε, γνωριμιών και με την έννοια του κερδίζω τεχνογνωσία, προσφέρω τεχνογνωσία, κερδίζω τεχνογνωσία. Οπότε αυτό είναι το, το ενδιαφέρον και αυτό ακριβώς προσπαθούμε να κάνουμε μέσα σε, ε, σε αυτή την πλατφόρμα. Όσο για τις επαναλήψεις, ε, πράγματι, έχει, ε, έχει επίσης ενδιαφέρον ότι μιλάμε συνέχεια στο ψηφιακό κόσμο για πολλή πληροφορία και είναι πολλή πληροφορία και συχνά είναι πολύ επαναλαμβανόμενη πληροφορία. Ωστόσο, ο, εμάς, ο σκοπός μας και πάλι εδώ είναι να αφήσουμε τις ομάδες και τους ανθρώπους να δημιουργήσουν. Δηλαδή, όχι να κόβουμε, να αξιολογούμε να λογοκρίνουμε, ακριβώς, αλλά ε, να δίνουμε βήμα και ε, σε, έχει παρατηρηθεί ότι σε τέτοιου είδους project ε, που ε, γράφουν για την προσωπική τους εμπειρία ε, δεν ε, αντιγράφουν και τα λοιπά, όντως γράφουν για, τις, για την προσωπική τους εμπειρία και για το προσωπικό τους ε, βίωμα. Αυτά είναι... Ναι. Προσθέτω μόνο το εξή όσον αφορά την ανάπτυξη της πλατφόρμας, οι βασικοί κανόνες του, ε, της προστασίας των προσωπικών δεδομένων ε, είναι στάνταρ ε, για όλες αυτές τις πλατφόρμες και επομένως ακολουθείτε. Δεύτερον, έχουμε μεταξύ των πανεπιστημίων ε, ήδη σε διαδικασία την υπογραφή των ε, κατάλληλων πρωτοκόλων για την διαδικασία που θα ακολουθηθεί, για την προστασία των, στις συνεντεύξεις, στα surveys και με τους, όλους τους ανθρώπους. Επομένως, αυτό συνολικά θα διαφυλάξει την προστασία των δεδομένων. Ε, και νομίζω ότι από, από αυτή την πλευρά, πλευρά καλυπτόμαστε. Από το θέμα της επαναληψιμότητας, ήθελα μόνο να προσθέσω στην κυρία ε, Πεντάζου ότι... Το έχουμε συζητήσει εσωτερικά. Γνωρίζουμε ότι θα υπάρξουν επαναλήψεις. Η αρχή της πλατφόρμας ε, θα ελεγχθεί από, τους επιστήμον, από το επιστημονικό προσωπικό κατά τη διάρκεια του project. Φυσικά και θα υπάρχει ένα αρχικό φιλτράρισμα των ίσως των κακοήθων ε, ε, προσθήκων. 
Αλλά από εκεί και πέρα θα πρέπει όντω να βρούμε ε, μία λύση για το αν δούμε ότι το πρόβλημα είναι μεγαλύτερο και ότι προκαλεί κάποιο είδους θέματα στην πλατφόρμα. Πάντως δεν το περιμένουμε αυτό έντονα για την ώρα. Να πάω ένα βήμα πίσω σε αυτό που λέει ο Στέλιος. Ε, η πλατφόρμα αυτή για να σχεδιαστεί, πέρα από το τεχνικό κομμάτι, ε, έγιναν πολλές ζυμώσεις με τους εταίρους του έργου και με εκπροσώπους από τη γαλλική ομάδα και από την πορτογαλική, για να αντιμετωπίσουμε ακριβώς το ζήτημα ποιος θα μπορεί να προσθέτει υλικό στην πλατφόρμα και με ποιες προϋποθέσεις. Και η αρχική σκέψη της ελληνικής κυρίως ομάδας ήταν να υπάρχει ένα επιστημονικό φιλτράρισμα της πληροφορίας που θα μπαίνει. Απ' την άλλη όμως πλευρά διατυπώθηκαν ε, πολύ έτσι, αξιόλογες και ορθές αντιρρήσεις και από τη γαλλική πλευρά και ενδεχομένως και από την πορτογαλική, αν θυμάμαι καλά, διορθώσει να κάνω λάθο, ότι το ζήτημα της συμμετοχική πλατφόρμας και το, το, το βασικό ερώτημα του project πώς οι ίδιοι άνθρωποι, οι πολίτες, οι διαφορετικές ομάδες αντιλαμβάνονται την κληρονομιά της Ελιάς, δεν πρέπει να υποστεί να είναι αντικείμενο φιλτραρίσματος. Δηλαδή το πώς εσείς αντιλαμβάνεστε την Ελιά είναι προσωπικό σας βίωμα. Δεν μπορεί να περάσει από το φίλτρο το δικό μου, το υποκειμενικό. Και συμφωνήσαμε ότι οπωσδήποτε θα υπάρχει υποκειμενισμός στο πώ οι άνθρωποι θα καταγράφουν το προσωπικό του βίωμα και την προσωπική του εμπειρία. Αλλά αυτό ήταν και ο στόχο τη πλατφόρμα. Και γι' αυτό ε, είπε ο Στέλιο, έτσι που με την Ιουλία, που έχουν το τεχνικ... την... πιο... είναι πιο κοντά στο τεχνικό κομμάτι, ότι θα υπάρξει οπωσδήποτε κάποιο φιλτράρισμα, αλλά όχι ε, 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 λογοκρισία. Θα υπάρξει φιλτράρισμα σε τυχόν κακοήθη σχόλια, σε τυχόν ε, άκυρε ε, ε, καταχωρήσει που προσβάλλουν ενδεχομένω ή ε, ε, είναι ακραίε, αλλά μέχρι εκεί. Και δεν θα, δε θα είπαμε, συμφωνήσαμε σαν consortium, ότι δεν, δεν θα μπούμε στη διαδικασία να αφαιρούμε ή να λογοκρίνουμε για την ώρα άλλου τύπου πληροφορία. Τώρα, όπως είπε και ο Στέλιος, αν δούμε στην πορεία ότι αυτό ε, ξεφύγει κάπως, θα δούμε τι θα κάνουμε. Αλλά ε, η Ιουλία, η οποία έχει ήδη ε, πολύτιμη εμπειρία σε ένα παρεμφερές πρόγραμμα με επίκεντρο το 1821, ε, αναφορικά με σχολεία ε, και εκπαιδευτικούς φορείς, οι οποίοι σε συμμετοχική πλατφόρμα προσθέτουν τις δικές τους εμπειρίες και τοπική ιστορία και μνήμες αναφορικά με το 2021. Όπως πολύ σωστά είπε, δεν ε, υπάρχει και τρόπος να το δεις και συνήθως οι άνθρωποι που καταθέτουν το βίωμά τους είναι ε, καινοτόμο, είναι πρωτότυπο, δεν προχωρούν σε, ε, σε επαναλήψεις γιατί τους δίνει τη δυνατότητα να πούν την προσωπική τους ιστορία μέσω αυτής της πλατφόρμας. Εντάξει, το παίρνω εγώ το μικρόφωνο. Άλλωστε, μην ξεχνάμε ότι θα γίνεται από τον καθένα λογαριασμό με τα προσωπικά του στοιχεία. Θα υπάρχει κάποιο είδου κοντρόλ σε αυτό το στάδιο, το ποιο βάζει τι. Επομένω, υπάρχει και μια έκθεση του τι ανεβάζει πάνω. Ε, δεν απαντάω στην επαναληψιμότητα, βέβαια, κύριε Καραμπάτε. Απαντάω στο περισσότερο στα κακοήθη πιθανών σχόλια που θέλει κάποιο να ανεβάσει. Αλλά θα υπάρχουν και keywords λέξεις κλειδιά, τα οποία θα γκρουπάρουν τις πληροφορίες και ίσως μέσα από αυτόν τον τρόπο θα μπορέσουμε, νομίζω, να κάνουμε ένα, ένα γκρουπάρισμα της πληροφορίας καλύτερο και πιο έτσι συνολικό. Ευχαριστώ. In a working project, in, pro in process, θα το δούμε πώς θα λειτουργήσει, αλλά είμαστε αισιόδοξοι ότι θα πάει καλά, γιατί υπάρχει προϋπάρχουσα εμπειρία και αρκετή τεχνογνωσία και από την ομάδα της Θεσσαλίας που θα το πραγματοποιήσει τεχνολογικά. Να κάνω μια ερώτηση. Ε, λοιπόν, και στις χθεσινές παρουσιάσεις και στις σημερινέ. Ε, είδαμε, νομίζω, την αξία της γαστρονομίας σε σχέση με το ελαιόλαδο και χτες, ε, αλλά και σήμερα το πρωί. Α, εγώ θέλω να σας ρωτήσω πόσο... Αν και είσαστε ακόμα στην αρχή αυτού του project και βάζετε τώρα χτίζετε τα κομμάτια, ε, πόσο διατεθειμένοι είστε να ακουμπήσετε σε αυτό το κομμάτι της γαστρονομίας και όταν λέω γαστρονομία, η γαστρονομία μιλάμε για τρεις διαφορετικές χώρες, όπως είδαμε και χτες μιλάμε για διαφορετικές ποικιλίε ελαιολάδου, μιλάμε για διαφορετικά μικροκλίματα, ε, διαφορετικές συνταγές, παραδοσιακές. Ε, 
Να σας δώσω ένα παράδειγμα, ας πούμε εδώ πέρα έχουμε μια συνταγή παραδοσιακή ε, με μια σαλάτα που είναι απλά πορτοκάλι, ελαιόλαδο και χοντρό αλάτι. Και αυτή η συνταγή έχει φτιαχτεί και με τα υλικά της περιοχής, αλλά επειδή και η ποικιλία εδώ της περιοχής στέργαζε πάρα πολύ σε αυτή τη συνταγή. Ε, πο, πόσο έχετε σκεφτεί ή πιστεύετε ότι θα επιλέξετε τη γαστρονομία σε αυτό το κομμάτι. Ευχαριστώ. Yes, of course, uh, gastronomy is part of uh, our heritage. It's a part of the heritage of the olive tree. When we when we talk about olive tree, is olive products, is uh, know-how, is uh, feasts and uh, rituals. So gastronomy is, of course, uh, not only the diet, but uh, the recipes and uh, the techniques, uh, culinary uh, techniques, uh, and, uh, and uh, the, the way to, to eat products, of course, are uh, in, uh, in our project. Um, we want to, to show um, gastronomy in the exhibition, but uh, we also want to, um, to um, create um, olive oil tasting uh, events uh, in our three countries. Uh, it's, it's one of the, the education tools that are uh, implemented in, uh, in the work package too. Um, in the in the third work package from for from the from the tourism perspective uh, we want of of course and uh, francisco and uh, the portuguese team uh, showed us uh, uh, during these two days uh, that gastronomy is a part an important part of uh, the the tourism uh, linked to the olive tree heritage so i think uh, it's a great part of our project So, uh, do you want to say there's a question? Oh, well, we don't have much time, but one more. Okay, please. Γεια σας και από μένα. Ονομάζομαι Αγγελική Σταματελοπούλου. Ε, είμαι στην τρίτη πλήρα αρχαιοτήτων και έργων τέχνης και δασολόγος και εργάζομαι στο Δήμο Καλαμάτας. Ε, θα ήθελα να αναφέρω ότι έχω... Ε, κάνει μία μελέτη, μία εργασία στο πλαίσιο του μεταπτυχιακού μου. Ε, έχω δημιουργήσει μία πολιτιστική διαδρομή πάνω στη νέα διαχρονική ελαιοκαλλιέργεια στο νομό Μεσσηνίας, ξεκινώντας α, από τη μία άκρη του νομού Μεσσηνίας έως την άλλη και πηγαίνοντας σταδιακά από τη μικιναϊκή εποχή έως τη σύγχρονη εποχή, ε, από την ελαιοκαλλιέργεια έως τη μεταποίηση, την καλλιέργεια, τη μεταποίηση και φτάνοντας στο σήμερα με την επανάχρηση ε, κτηρίων ε, με διάφορους τρόπους. Ε, και θα ήθελα να ρωτήσω, στο, στην πλατφόρμα αυτή θα μπορούσε να ανέβει μια τέτοια μελέτη, μια τέτοια εργασία και με ποιο τρόπο. Ευχαριστώ. Αυτό ε, στην πλατφόρμα θα μπορούσαν να ανέβουν μέρη μια τέτοια, ε, ε, γιατί ενδιαφέρει και περισσότερο, ενδιαφέρουν περισσότερο τα, ε, τα στοιχεία, έτσι, τα επιμέρους στοιχεία, ένα-ένα, όχι το συνολικό κομμάτι, ε, προκειμένου ακριβώς τα στοιχεία, γιατί ο στόχος είναι να μπορούν να συνδυαστούν και όλες μεταξύ τους τα στοιχεία. Ε, μνημεία, ηλιοτρίβια, ελαιώνες, οπότε με μονομένα στοιχεία βεβαίως και μπορούν να ανέβουν. Ναι, ακριβώς. Δηλαδή, τεχνικά μπορεί να ανέβει και ολόκληρη, αλλά αυτό που ενδιαφέρει είναι τα μεμονωμένα στοιχεία. Ναι. Επειδή γνωρίζω και τη δουλειά της κυρίας Σταματελοπούλου, που είναι εξαίρετη, έχει και διαδρομές μέσα οργανωμένες ήδη, οι οποίε θα μπορούσαν να εμπλουτίσουν τις διαδρομές που θα προταθούν στην πλατφόρμα. Και θα, πάρω, θα μου επιτρέψετε έτσι να καταχραστώ λίγο το χρόνο σας και θα πάρω αυτή την ευκαιρία επειδή εντυπωσιάστηκα από την πορτογαλική ομάδα που ανέδειξε τους uh, master students τους, ε, δηλαδή τους φοιτητές που κάνουν τα μεταπτυχιακά που εμπλέκονται ενεργά στην έρευνα, θα ήθελα και εγώ να 
πω ένα μεγάλο ευχαριστώ στην Ιουλία Ράμου, που πλέον ήταν η παλιά μας φοιτήτρια και πλέον μέλος των δρόμων της Ελιάς και από ό,τι καταλαβαίνω ικανό για τη βοήθειά της σήμερα. Έτσι και να, γιατί το ζήτημα είναι και η νέα γενιά, τι κάνει, όχι μόνο εμείς πια που είμαστε generation, πώς μας είπατε, ξεπερασμένοι. <laughs> Why, <laughs> Who knows. <laughs> Ευχαριστούμε και τους νέους. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. So, I think that uh, it's time to do the closing remarks. I would like to ask Julie to say something, some words just to, uh, <laughs> to sum up this, uh, this event, the new challenges, just that. And if uh, Francisco Diaz and also a representative from the Greek team uh, want to share Uh, some final words, please do it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, I have uh, just a few words to say. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for coming. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your information, your thoughts and uh, your reflections together um, with us. Um, I think it's um, the, the word that summarizes all. Uh, our, our purpose in Olive for All is to uh, work together, all together, not only scientists, but uh, all actors or people who, who like, who love, who work with Olive Tree. And, and I think this was a, a great moment for my opinion. Uh, it was a great moment because uh, we were all sharing our, uh, our thoughts. So thank you very much. And I hope you'll be there um, in uh, one year in Portugal and uh, that we will we, uh, keep on sharing uh, these uh, thoughts and your, uh, and your contribution is needed in this project because you are all part of it. So thank you. On behalf of, uh, of the Greek team, and I will uh, pass the mic then to Marinella, uh, I would like to, to say that what this symposium showed us is that uh, there is a great variety of actors and stakeholders uh, dealing with uh, and researching the olive heritage. And this diversity is actually so rich as the diversity of the olives, uh, olive varieties. Um, uh, so I think that uh, our project, the Olive for All project, gives and offers uh, such a rare opportunity for all these different voices to be heard and hopefully brought together either through research or colloquia, uh, symposia, or through the platform or the museum exhibition. Of course, a project cannot save the world, uh, but it can uh, plant some seeds Excuse me, now it's, uh, it's uh, lunch time, so I will be very graphic. Plant some seeds and let's hope that uh, these efforts will develop and flourish also in the future. Uh, before I give you, pass you the mic, so you can invite us also to Portugal, I would like to, to ask Marinella, uh, as representative of the Routes of the Olive Tree, who has been central in supporting this, um, this event. Uh... Εγώ θα ήθελα να ευχαριστήσω πάρα πολύ τους, ε, τους συνεργάτες μας που ήρθαν, που διάσκεις, πέταξαν από την άλλη άκρη της Ευρώπης και ήρθαν μέχρι εδώ τους Πορτογάλους και τους Γάλους που μας, έκαναν, μας έδωσαν αυτή τη μεγάλη χαρά να έρθουμε για μας σαν δρόμοι Ελιάς. Το Α και το Ω είναι η συνεργασία, είναι ο διάλογος και αυτή η συνάντηση μας έδωσε την ευκαιρία πάλι να αναδείξουμε αυτό το δώρο που είναι ο διάλογος, ο διαπολιτισμικός διάλογος. Αυτό είναι η πηγή των πάντων. Και τους ευχαριστώ πάρα πάρα πολύ για αυτό το, για αυτό το ταξίδι που κάνανε και ήρθαν μέχρι εδώ ακολουθώντας τους δρόμους της Ελιάς, ο καθένας από τη δική του χώρα. Επίση, ήθελα να πω αυτό που είπε η Μαρία, ότι σαν, σαν δρόμοι Ελιάς θέλω πολύ να ευχαριστήσω τους νέους που έχουμε. Θέλουμε να μεταδώσουμε αυτό που εμείς την εμπειρία μας, την τεχνογνωσία μας στους νέους, την Ιουλία, 
στα παιδιά που είναι εδώ και θα συνεχίσουμε να το κάνουμε γιατί αυτή είναι το μέλλον. Ε, είναι αυτό, η συνεργασία και μετάδοση στις νεότερες γενιές. Είναι το α και το ω. Και σας ευχαριστώ πολύ όλους που, είσαστε, που ήρθατε στην Καλαμάτα και θα χαρούμε πάρα πολύ να σας ξαναδούμε και να ξαναβρεθούμε και να κάνουμε ωραία πράγματα μαζί. I don't know. Don't know. I don't know how to start because uh, I'm a lot. I have a lot of feelings regarding this good ex exper experience. Uh, but I think that all we uh, that attend this uh, symposium benefit a lot uh, of sharing, of to be, be together, because we worked a uh, long uh, one year without this close contact, uh, and we need sometimes uh, to verify that what we are doing is actually uh, useful for each other. So this, from this point of view, was great. Another point that I liked much, and uh, I think also, or oh, you also like it like me, was the human experience that you feel here in Greece, in Kalamata, uh, two, day, uh, two, uh, two days ago and yesterday. Uh, was a, it, was a, it was great and it's uh, for life experience for life and i hope that next next year in portugal we will retribute in the same way thank you very much so i have the responsibility to finish works um but don't forget that um france waits for us in May, in May 2023, in the museum exhibition, and one month later, uh, we in Portugal expect uh, all of you to be with us, uh, presentially or online. So thank you for all this experience and uh, good trips, and to the ones that must go home. Okay, bye and thank you. <laughs>